Okay. Hey, mic works. Yeah. Right, check that out. Welcome to DevOps Days Chicago. Thank you. I am one of your MCs for the next two days. My name is Maddie. I'm Jeff. You're going to get sick of hearing our voices, but you know we're going to help guide you through the next uh, two days of conference talk. So uh, while you're, oh, hey, that's yours, Ken. No, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. We're going a little fluid. What a great start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to see a lot of Maddie and I, but we are not the only people involved with this. There are a ton of volunteers and organizers that help put this conference together. And here's a picture of them. S uh, you'll see some of these folks and others are going to be wearing these red DevOps Days Chicago shirts throughout the venue, uh, including our organizers and our volunteers. These are the folks, if you have any questions or you need assistance, anything like that, find one of us. If you're wearing a red shirt of your own, I'm sorry that people will be asking you a question. So remind, I'll tell you sometime about the year that our shirts were green and pager duty shirts were green, and that was fun to continue. I strategically did not wear a red shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is for the Wi-Fi. The network is convened. The password is stay connected. Remember, this is a shared resource, so be you know respectful of our uh, your uh, co-conferencing people, so, you know, maybe pulling down two gig Docker files. Is, did anybody have a two gig Docker file? But No Baldur's Gate 3. Please don't, yeah. So, uh, Live captioning is available. Uh, transcriptions, uh, thanks to our uh, live transcription sponsor, Sim. Uh, you can download this to your own device, or you can keep an eye on it on these monitors here. Uh, our, tw our social media platform, formerly known <laughs> as Twitter, handle is DevOps stays shy. Uh, I'm not going to call it X. I'm just not going to do it yet. I'm not there. I'm not ready. Um, but our preferred hashtag is DevOps stays since we want to make sure that we are contributing to the conversation for all DOD events. So if you just use the hashtag DevOps stays, that'll make sure that everyone uh, gets all of our photos and realizes what they're missing by not being here. And if you want to go old school legacy DevOps stays Chicago, you can also use the hashtag deep dish DevOps if you've been around before. But we encourage you to take lots of pictures, share posts, share little tidbits, anecdotes that you find useful throughout the conference, you know, get the word out. So uh, just a, a quick little uh, step through. Um, before, before we, uh, we'll talk about the second, actually. So the very first DevOps days took place in 2009 in a town called Ghent in Belgium. And if you're ever curious about why we call it DevOps, it's because Agile System Administration was too long of a name for a conference. <laughs> So uh, so we've been doing this thing for quite some time, and uh, DevOps days happen all over the world, and they are all run by local teams. So we have the Chicago version. We've been doing this since 2014. Um, but all these cities all over the world <laughs> do them their own way. And we have, uh, it's, so it's a, it's a really key part of the evolution of the DevOps movement. One can say it's where it started. Uh, 2009 was kind of an interesting year. A lot, a lot of things happened. Uh, inflection point there, but one of the things special that happened uh, this year, yesterday, is similar to in 2019 for the 10th anniversary of DevOps Days in Ghent, uh, we brought together some of those where we said that these DevOps Days are organized by people all over the world. We brought a whole bunch of us together in Ghent in 2019 to talk about how can we do this better, how can we collect, how can we work together, and we did one yesterday here in Chicago. So we brought a lot of friends from all over the world to come, and I said, cool, you want to come to the summit? You have to come to DevOps Day Chicago too. So we actually have a bunch of awesome uh, friends from all over uh, joining us in our conversations, and this is a couple things that happened yesterday. All right, so raise your hand if you were at the very first DevOps Day Chicago in 2014. Cool. We were in this same building. It was a very different venue and a very different number of people. But now I'm going to ask a, a different question. I'm going to go on the other side. How many people, this is your first DevOps days ever? Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. So, yeah, uh, we've, we've definitely had, this is, the, you know, these are pictures from, from when we were here in the, in the Sears Tower again, a few floors higher, but uh, not nearly as nice of a space. And we have a, a wonderful space here to have all of our conversations today, and I think if you look at that list of, or the picture of organizers, some of us are still around and wearing a slightly different color red. Uh, so uh, who was, anybody, uh, just out of curiosity, anybody who was here last year, not here, but at DevOps Day Chicago last year, so 
Cool, awesome. Um, we're not going to go through every single year of when you were there or not because honestly, we just want to get to the conference and stop listening to Maddie and Jeff talk. But fun fact, I don't know if you knew this, I the first DevOps days that I went to, I actually came on a community ticket through Blacks and Technology. Excellent, and it yes. Absolutely changed the trajectory of my career. So, uh, you know. Well, I'm glad we could help. Big up to this conference. Uh, love these guys. So, and if you don't, again, just uh, sorry not to make this all about you, but we're going to. Uh, Jeff has also spoken at almost all of our all of our uh, DevOps days that we've had since uh, the first one when he came and attended. So he's a great great part of this, and love having you as our MC today. But uh, why don't you talk about what people have in store for them today? Yeah, especially so we have a lot of folks who are new to DevOps days and maybe might not know exactly how we do stuff. Absolutely, I'm telling you, you're going to have a ton of fun here. So uh, day one program structure is we're going to do full talks in the morning. Uh, we'll have a lunch break at noon. And then we're going to do Ignites uh, after lunch. Now, Ignites are basically like a five-minute uh, talk format. And it is way more difficult than you might think. You're like, oh, five minutes. So we'll just be able to bang that out. It's really, really fun to watch these Ignites. So uh, really uh, excited for that. Um, after the Ignites, you're going to have so, uh, really uh, excited for that. Um, after the Ignites, you're going to have two options. You're going to be able to either attend technical workshops or you're going to be able to do the open spaces from 1.30 until 4.45. Now, I'm not throwing shade on the technical workshops. They're going to be great. But let me tell you, open spaces is awesome. Uh, if you've never been part of one, Maddie's going to explain how they work a little bit later. But they are really what makes DevOps Day special. I mean, I live for this. Baldur's Gate 3 for this. So it is absolutely going to be uh, an incredible time. And it's an opportunity for you to make the conference exactly what you need to get out of it. And the good thing is you don't actually have to completely make the choice because there's multiple things happening throughout. So you can go to some open spaces, you go to some workshops, do a little bit of both. And we again, we'll talk about those. So these are our speakers today. Um, we're really excited to have all these folks joining us uh, and you know, from all sorts of different uh, aspects of DevOps and parts of the world and different backgrounds and ages, perhaps. Um, but you'll learn more about each of them today uh, as they as they give their presentation and their talks. But we just would love to get a great round of applause for our speakers. We we could not do this without them. <laughs> now, herein ends the treating speaker special part. Just kidding. Everybody, take a look at your badge. Notice that your badge says the word participant. Notice that everybody's badge says the word participant. Nobody has a badge that says sponsor or speaker or organizer. We all say participant because one of the key things about DevOps days is we're all here to participate together. And there's two key things about how we do this and why we think it's important. So one is that we're all the same, right? So we heavily encourage you. If you're here as a sponsor, we appreciate you. And that's amazing. And we'd love for you to be involved in what's happening. You know, And again, I've worked booth duty. I've done it. We get it. But also be part of what's happening here. Our speakers and our organizers, you'll see everyone is engaging throughout the days together. And then the other part of that, though, is it doesn't say attendee. It says participant. And that's a key thing. And when we talk about the open spaces, we are creating over the next two days, all of us in this room together are creating something that will never happen again. And we're all going to learn from each other. We all have different things. And we're going we're gonna to engage. And it's going to be amazing. And we have amazing speakers. I'm so proud to have them here. But if we weren't participating together, we'd just be standing up here talking to nobody. But we're not talking at you. And I believe really strongly when we put our program together that our talks we have in the morning are fodder for the open space conversations and the hallway tracks and things we have. That our DevOps as well, it's not a Chicago is, Chicago is, you'll know is, you'll know is, you'll notice it is a single track. We are all seeing the same stuff together this morning, which will help us be able to have awesome, amazing, engaging conversations throughout the, the two days. And if you flip your badge over, if you look on the back, you're going to see a nice handy dandy map of the venue. It's going to be super. Might helpful. be a little bit of an eye chart, but right, yeah, a little, little bit, right. But I brought my glasses, so we're good. <laughs> I think it's sort of laid out. Talk spaces, um, spaces, um, swag, um, swag, where the sponsor area is. So if you're ever lost, one, it's a big square, so eventually you'll get to where <laughs> you need to go. But uh, if you want to take a shortcut, just flip your badge over and take a look at the map. And that's a, a great thing you'll you'll see as we go through this space. There's lots of 
uh, great areas to have conversations. Also, the, the we have there are phone rooms if you need to take a call, you need some, or you just need some quiet time for yourself. There's lots of areas and spaces for that. Uh, I remember when we were doing the venue tour a few weeks ago, and Kevin, who is our AV and logistics person on our team, we were walking through, and as we went, he said, "Get ready to see the best hallway track park you've ever seen." I was like, "Oh yeah!" yeah. So it will be super fun. Um, and while we're here, it's also important to remember that here at DevOps Days, we have a code of conduct. It's on the website at devopsdays.org slash Chicago. You'll find it there. And uh, please make yourself familiar with it because we do enforce this. Not everyone is exactly like you or exactly like me, and that's a good thing. Uh, we don't want to judge or make assumptions because someone is different, whether in some visible way or in their lived experiences. So we would, our idea, we, our code of conduct is we treat each other with respect. We're here to share and learn from each other. And everyone here has something to offer and something to learn. Um, again, if you have any uh, issues with a code of conduct violation, something happens, even if you're not sure, you know, we'd like you to default, you can either email us at help at devopsstayshy.org or find anybody in a red shirt, we'll help you out. Now, because you all read all the emails that I sent you over the last couple weeks. Right. <laughs> you may have seen that there was an email from something called Call of Conduct, so that's some software we were experimenting with. It's just not quite ready for us to do today. So we are gonna be using our normal way of doing Code of Conduct, email us, find us, whatever. Um, maybe sometime in the future, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but do not, uh, we're not ready to be using that today. Uh, health and safety masks are optional this year, um, but uh, harassing someone that's wearing a mask is just not going to be accepted, right? So everyone's free to make their own choices, and we want to respect those choices. Um, second bullet, super important. If you start to feel sick, don't be a hero, right? <laughs> Please stay away from the conference. Respect your other attendees. Um, ask someone that's immunocompromised. That's incredibly important for me. So let's just make sure we're being responsible to each other. And we're not necessarily doing a big formal contact tracing, but if you do get sick, if you're comfortable, we'd appreciate it if you email and let us know so that way we can um, just, if, if, if anything is, is happening. And just as a reminder, um, we will be checking Vax cards and tests again tomorrow. We're just doing that every day. Hopefully, now we kind of know how that goes. Um, should move smoothly, but we wanted to keep our policy uh, to what was agreed upon a few months ago for, for, for folks. All right, so uh, in, in addition to all of the volunteers, right, DevOps Days cannot happen without the help of our sponsors. So we want to give a big shout out to all of our sponsors that help make this possible. There's actually two sponsor sections. Yes, um, and it's also where the food is, so. Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, please support sponsors. You know, swing by the booth, hear what they got to say. You know, there's a lot of great tools, a lot of great services out there, so I'm sure they've got something for what ails you. Also, uh, we have a sponsor passport you, uh, that's out in various places. You can find it, and if you get a stamp from a certain number of, uh, basically, I think it's six in each area, uh, you turn that in and you get two things out of that. One is when you come up to our, uh, where you entered, we have our, we'll have our swag store. You can exchange that passport for a piece of DevOps Day Chicago swag. Uh, we have some baseball hats, we have some mugs, and we also have some cute yaks. So if you've seen the yaks and you want a yak, that's how you get one. But the other thing is we will be doing a drawing for some amazing prizes tomorrow that your entry is with that. So we're giving away Nintendo Switch. We have uh, that Lego kit. We have some uh, signed copies of some book by some dude. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> which I am personally, you know, having to figure out how I'm going to get Jeff to sign mine. Um, but also, uh, we, I was told to please uh, give the disclaimer that these are the things you can enter to win. This is not something you just trade your passport in and we give you Nintendo Switch. So, our sponsors have been very generous to us, but we didn't have that much extra money to give everybody Nintendo Switch. So, cool. And we will be doing that drawing tomorrow. There's a, we're going to see tomorrow's schedule uh, in the afternoon was when we will be doing the raffle for that. And also, many of the sponsors that you'll see are doing entries and they'll be giving those away at that time as well. And if you need anything, help at devopsstayshy.org will go to us, and it's actually in a Slack thing that we'll see right away. It's, you know, because obviously we're a little distracted for email and such. And then as well, also anybody, you can go up to our registration desk where the swag store is, look for any of us in the red shirts, and we're super happy to help you in, in any way that you need. Okay, so uh, 
as we said, you know, the URIs are a huge part of this uh, conference, so your feedback is absolutely requested. Um, after the event, I think we're gonna do- are We're we gonna do it today, you'll get, a, you'll get an email today and tomorrow with uh, just some feedback survey. We absolutely appreciate your, your feedback, it's how we improve. Yep, it's the only way we can get better. You know, I learned that I need to curse less, so that uh, was super helpful feedback. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, please, please fill out the surveys, thanks. And without further ado, because you're probably sick of hearing us talk, let's get this party started, right? So we're going to start with our first set of speakers, Katie McLaughlin and Amanda Lewis. How's everyone doing? Energy, yeah, yeah. Hello. Okay, we're good. Okay, we're ready to go. Let's do Excellent. this. Excellent. Hello, Chicago. Hello. Um, the 2022 State of DevOps report is out now. The 2023 report is in progress, but I have the 2022 report here. Everyone's read this one, yeah? yeah. Uh, who hasn't? Okay, great. Since I have you I heard here, cover to cover over here. Cover to cover. Well, since, since everyone's here, I'll start with the executive summary. Over the last eight years, <laughs> oh, we have produced... Oh, uh, Katie. Yeah. What, what are you doing? Uh, since everyone's here and they haven't read the report, why don't I just read it to them? Well, since I heard somebody read it cover to cover over here, I thought oh. we'd do something different. Oh, what? I mean, I look cute. We look adorable, but what's this? Well... You know, one of the key findings in 2022 was that context matters. Oh. And I know you had planned to read out the executive summary, and it would have been incredible. Yeah. It really would have. Um, but I thought maybe we'd do something a little bit different since the 2023 report is coming out soon. Why don't we bring the, li the, the report to life with story time? Okay, well, as long as everyone knows here, between you and me and everyone else here, this is a fictional story. Yes, we should do some disclaimers. The story all names characters and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons, living or deceased, places, buildings, or products is intended or should be inferred. And also, no animals were harmed in the telling of this story. Not even this guy. Yeah, especially not that guy. So, speaking of disclaimers, I do have to give a, a bit of a warning, Katie. Okay. The topic of today's story time, it may cause you and the audience to remember a time of high stress. Should I sit back down or am I good? Maybe, I mean, Maddie, we might need a chair, so if you could just keep an eye on Katie. So today, I thought for story time we'd talk about <laughs> Log for Show. Okay, I think I'm okay. All right, so let's go back in time to December 10th, 2021. Is it okay if I take some notes? You might need to, I mean, there's a whiteboard just there. Uh, I'm a little lazy, I'm gonna okay, keep cool. it up here, yeah. cool. Um, so, where were you when you heard about log for show Oh, gosh. It would have been a Friday. I mean, obviously, I was planning to do a pretty lightweight day, you know, hashtag, you know, deploy Fridays. And so I probably had some shopping, holiday shopping to do, day shopping to do, you know, really important business. All right. So, I'm kind of seeing that this is what your Friday looked. Pretty chill. Yeah, pretty chill, pretty chill. But then everything changed. Okay. So walk me through it. You started here. You heard about the CVE. Yes, and I knew that a CVE would change virtually everything. But it was really going, it was about, it felt like going through the five stages of grief. It was like a roller coaster. Denial, I mean, okay, back in 2021, Twitter was still a thing, and that's the place where I first heard about this issue. <laughs> but was this actually an important issue that I needed to resolve right away? Anger, shoot, yes, this is real, it's important. Bargaining, well, I mean, it's just part of some logging software. How bad could it be? I could disappear for Christmas and come back and fix it later, right? I can put it on the backlog. Depression, as I started digging deeper, it started to realize, oh no, this was a real thing. And my weekend was about to take a change for the worst. And then acceptance, I declared myself incident commander. And we started our incident response procedures, spun up a Slack channel, started getting all the subject matter experts in, and called the missus and told her it would be a long weekend. Okay, so it really wasn't a straight line. This is more like a roller coaster. Yeah, I think you captured it well. 
I mean, I needed a plan, of course, to attack all this, and I went to one of my favorite tools, the OODA loop. Oh, the breakfast cereal? I love Fruit Loops. No, not really. OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. Observe, hark, there is a vulnerability. Orient, let's figure out which systems we need to fix in production that need to be addressed. Decide, well, that's easy. We're going to upgrade Log4j and then act. We'll get the team to work. All right, so how many production systems do you have and how many were impacted? We went through all our different systems and we worked out there was about 400 different systems. Okay, 400. Um, how long did that take you to assess that many systems? Oh, it took us a good two minutes. I mean, we just had to go through all our S-bombs and see which ones had Log4j installed. <laughs> oh my god, this is amazing. Like, I mean, I've heard about S-bombs, but has anybody here heard about it actually being successful? This is incredible. So that, you must have gotten through that really quick. So what did you do next? Yeah, I wish it was that simple. Uh, we didn't actually have S-bombs back then. We had to manually inspect every one of our 400 systems, meaning calling in subject matter experts and had to get them to do work over the weekend. By Monday morning, we had identified that there were two major applications that were the most critical, and we knew we needed to fix those two. Okay, you got me. You, uh, you got me. So which two did you fix? All right. The two big systems we had to fix were firstly our order management system. This system has been around forever and it's truly the heart of our business. If it's offline, customers can't buy anything, we can't ship anything, everything stops. The other one is our primary e-commerce website, the website that everyone sees. If, uh, if they don't see it, then we're in trouble. All right, so let's start with the e-commerce website because I'm going to expect uh, tackling that, the order management system, is going to be much more difficult. So, and since an order starts at the website, let's start there. Next place to go in this story. Yeah, we didn't have a very good or easy resolution for the website. Decisions that we made long ago had come back to bite us. The site, when it was being designed, we did not have the expertise on our team and we knew that we wanted my a modern architecture. We wanted microservices. And so we hired consultants and used a vendor to ship the site, and ultimately we paid for functionality, not knowledge and documentation. Oh. Well, I imagine like that was a good decision at the time, right? Yeah. Because it's a good trade-off when you're in a situation where your team doesn't have the expertise. And bringing in a partner, awesome solution. But what's important is that your team is upskilled during that, and so when the you know, the vendor walks away, you have all those skills to continue on. So I'm a little bit anxious to ask this, but do you have access to the code or did you have to reach out to the vendor to get this done? Thankfully, the website is on our architecture and in our source control across a measly 27 different repos. Since the marketing team has a UI where they use to add more products, remove products, update inventory, we only had to make changes to the code base itself maybe once or twice a year. Those updates would be strategically planned, and they took two months to get through all the manual testing. We were able to quickly identify where Log4j was throughout our application. Unfortunately, that was the easy part of the process. There was no automated builds, so we had to do that manually without any automated testing in place. <sighs> I may need to sit down again. Okay. So, uh, there's no automated testing, there's no automated build process. I feel that this next part of the story, there's a high likelihood of failure. Yeah, when we tried to build even the first microservice after updating Log4j, instead of the magic number being 27, it was 500. It turns out all these microservices were really tightly coupled. So when you saw the 500, how did you see it and then how did you fix it? Oh, after we deployed, we would just open up the website and click around and see if it worked. <laughs> All right. Well, that, it that didn't. doesn't sound like a very good, like, fun weekend, Katie. Oh, no, we didn't even start deploying any changes until Monday. It took us all weekend just to identify where Log4j was in our systems. And then we had to make the plan to prioritize remediation in the teams. In the end, the team spent all week updating and testing the 27 services that made up the site. And by the next Friday afternoon, they were ready to deploy the changes. So about a week, right? <laughs> well, remember, it, 
we had this all ready to go on Friday, and we remember, hashtag no deploy Fridays. <laughs> so we couldn't actually do any action on Friday. Oh, and the changes for the site had to go through the change approval board that only met on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But luckily, we could call an emergency session of the cab for a Monday. And after looking through all the changes, the cab was a bit uncomfortable with our deployment. I mean, they asked the development team to do more testing. I mean, sure, probably a good idea. Good thing too, because you know, as one good vulnerability deserves another, there were a couple of updates for Log4j in rapid succession. And so the cab suggested holding off a little bit until the releases for Log4j stabilized. This meant that we could batch all our changes together in the one release. Turns out there were four updates in total, and the last one wasn't released until the 28th of December. OK, so let me get this down. Got done on the 28th, if I carry the one. So it took you 18 days. Yeah. About. OK, well, so quite a lot of red up there, Katie. Yeah. But, you know. Hearing this story, I don't know how everyone else is feeling right now, but I'm getting my blood pressure is going up a little bit, a little stressed. How was, like, how's the team doing? Were they burning out through this process? It was the holidays. Not just burnt out, but more crispy by the end of that <laughs> Wednesday morning. The long hours obviously contributed, but it was just the stress of that vulnerability, the uncertainty whether the changes would work, and that heavyweight change approval process. It was difficult for the team to assess just how long it would get from commit to approved to deployed to working. All right, so I'm curious, because obviously that sounds rough. How have they fared since? Because like you said, one good you know, vulnerability deserves another. There were, have been a few since then, maybe one a couple months after the open SSL. One, how did they handle that? Did it go better? Oh, they were spared from that particular CVE because they were still on the 1.1 branch. But having advanced warning of a pending update did help, but it also reminded them of the progress they still needed to make. It is still a journey. Okay, so I don't know if we're all ready for this, but that was a great recap for the e-commerce team. Let's dig in. Let's go to a potentially scary place. Let's talk about the order management system. You know, that system you said is the heart of the business. It's been around for a long time. It's probably slower than the microservices-based front end. See, I think, like, I mean, you might think that, but the OMS is an older, larger application that's been built in-house, and it's more of a macro service than a microservice architecture, but unlike the e-commerce site, the OMS is something that our, our internal teams have been actively developing over the years. In fact, over the previous two years, the OMS team was able to go from quarter quarterly releases to deploying updates to the system weekly. So in many respects, they were much more better prepared when the Log4Shell vulnerability was announced. Well, this is a twist. So how did it go? Well, by Monday morning, the team had identified the three components that were impacted. They upgraded the Log4J library on one of the components. And then their continuous integration progress, uh, continuous integration process automatically kicked in. A jar file was built, automated tests were run, and the jar file was automatically deployed to the test environment. The team took their passing tests and their vetted pipeline to the cab and the approval to deploy was rubber stamped. Ship it, they said, and the team did so. <laughs> Wait, didn't you say there were three components and they only updated one? Yes, but all the components are built in a way where they could be independently tested and deployed. And everyone is comfortable with this because this is how things had been working in practice for over a year at that point. All right, so one down, two to go, pretty easy. You had everything shipped by Wednesday. Almost. Uh, the tests failed after updating the second component, and it took a while to track down and fix that particular issue. Uh, we've talked about this team before. Mm. They're the ones that prioritize broken builds. Yes, as soon as the test for the second component failed, everyone stopped what they were doing for the third component and went and rallied behind trying to find a fix for those broken tests. It was a pretty elusive bug, and it took the team most of the day to track it down, but everything was ready to deploy by Wednesday morning. And then Thursday came around, and the third component was released. And everything was fine. Well, thank you to all of you. Thank you to Katie for reliving and going through this. You know, I think I can maybe help after hearing all of this. Oh, really? Amanda, how do you think we could help the website team have the experience that the order management team had in the future? Well, Dora. The Explorer? <laughs> no, not that Dora. 
Oh, oh, the Digital uh, Operation Resilience Act. Not that one either. Uh, there might be some people here that are in that jurisdiction, but most of us, I think, that doesn't apply to us today. Right. We do have a couple of people that flew over I from know. Europe, though. So I'm sorry if that also created high stress. Uh, but for today, and for our purposes, we're going to talk about the DevOps Research and Assessment. Uh, DORA is an ongoing research program uh, we, where we're seeking to understand how teams get better at delivering and operating software. The program's been around for about a decade. Um, during that time, there was an organization that was created with that same name called DORA. It was um, started by Dr. Nicole Forgesgren, Jean Kim, and Jez Humble. Um, and in addition to the annual State of DevOps reports, and it was so great to see how many people read the 2022, they also, in 2018, uh, released the book Accelerate. How many people have read Accelerate? Great book, I encourage you to read that. Um, so then, later that year, Dora, the company, was acquired by Google Cloud. And the Dora team uh, at Google Cloud has continued to research into the processes and the capabilities that predict the outcomes that we all you know, hold kind of dear to our hearts of what DevOps is. And I think it's really important to note that the research team has continued to keep this tool and platform agnostic. I personally have truly enjoyed the opportunity to work with the DORA research team. We were all together last week working on the 2023 report. Um, and for me, it's been interesting to work with a research team to, to really understand their practice, right? The, the oath, the ethics, and just kind of the passion they bring to it. Um, we bring, obviously, a passion to it from the other side, but it's really great to work together. For, you know, the survey closed a couple weeks ago. Thank you to all of you who participated. Without you, we wouldn't have a 2023 uh, report. And unlike Log for Show, which was not a great Christmas or holiday uh, present, um, I feel kind of like a kid waiting to open my gift for that report to come out. And I don't think I'll have to wait for Christmas, maybe just like pumpkin spice season. Oh, so I don't have to wait till peppermint season. Right. Okay, cool. Yes, that is my goal or hope. So after eight years of research, we continue to see the technical capabilities build on each other to create better performance. As in years past, we saw the benefits inherent in using cloud and a positive workplace culture. <laughs> Oops. If you go back a slide, sorry, it thanks. said Amanda has to say a thing. There you go. Oh, sorry. I was often not, I'm thinking about the 2023 report. Uh, but in 2022, you know, we investigated technical and cultural practices um, that enable a more secure software supply chain. And as well as the drivers of organizational performance, so reliability, use of cloud, and company culture, we also, for the first time, we studied how technical capabilities affect teams differently when you kind of combine those capabilities. Oh, so it's like a maturity model with a built-in roadmap. No. Oh. So I can see where you would think that, and you know, the whole context matters things that we learned in 2022. Um, but one of those things is in previous years, right, we've talked about how delivery performance drives organizational performance. But what we saw in 2022 is that, yes, delivery performance drives organizational performance, but only when your operational performance is also high. So we need to understand how your team is doing. There are other things that we learned in the report, including that teams must mature their reliability practices. But how do you measure reliability? Reliability is a multifaceted measure of how well teams uphold these commitments. And in this report, we continued our explorations into reliability as a factor of software delivery and operations. You know, at Google, we do site reliability engineering, or SRE. But what does that actually mean, though? Well, it covers some of these practices, regular reliability reviews, reducing toil, and doing things like reprioritizing work as teams miss their reliability targets. But one of the fascinating things we found in the research, we see that teams that are embracing these practices, just as they begin to embrace these practices, their reliability has a tendency to drop. Wait, Katie, drop? Like it's worse? Like go down. Yeah. Ooh. But we see that teams that stick with it and put more of those practices in place and mature those practices, they reach an inflection point where they really start to see their reliability go up in a meaningful way. So the important takeaway here is that as you start transforming how your team works, you have to have the commitment to stick with it because you might observe that your team seems to slip along the way. 
but reliability is required. Without it, software delivery doesn't predict organizational success. And you know, sticking with it, I imagine that can be really hard. Well, actually, I know it can be really hard. And because when we see that dip in performance, then a lot of people start asking questions, but we have to keep going. Because as we see, while it's not a roadmap, these technical capabilities build on each other. Um, and so different capabilities build on each other. Um, Katie, what are some examples of capabilities that build on one another? Well, I'm glad you asked. Take these four particular capabilities. Here's a hot take for you. In 2023, if you don't have version control, that's a liability. Continuous integration is also no longer the huge technical challenge it was in previous years. There are so many options around so many frameworks and programming languages to help you validate your code at a unit level. But continuous delivery and loosely coupled architecture aren't as commonly adopted, according to our research, as they are harder than just stuffing things in Git, yeah? But making sure that you can apply your changes in a way that prevents the magic 500 number, the ephemeral smoke that you would get in a hardware deployment, is a much harder challenge and is going to depend greatly on your specific architecture and your specific application. But in our story, we had microservices that weren't loosely coupled, but our macroservices order management system was. Loosely coupled isn't just counting the number of systems, it's actually, are they loosely coupled? Can they be deployed independently? Teams that, who make higher than average use of all these capabilities have, according to our research, a 3.8 times higher organizational performance. Yes, and along with the findings we see with reliability, as I said earlier, we looked deeply at security in 2022. And specifically, we dug into the security of your software supply chain. And we found a number of interesting findings. You know, first, that adoption of security controls have already begun. And we used some frameworks to measure those security, co um, security controls. Uh, Katie, do you want to ask me which ones? Which ones, Amanda? <laughs> Thank you for asking. I'm so glad. So uh, Salsa and SSDF. Now, Katie, I know right now you're thinking about chips and salsa or maybe going salsa dancing, but just like Dora has a lot of meetings, this one is actually the supply chain levels for software architects, and then S, um, the SSDF is your secure software development framework. And these frameworks, really what they do is they provide incremental, adoptable levels for us and requirements for our software supply chain security. Now, we also saw in the report that you know, software supply chain security practices embodied in Salsa and SSDF, they've already have modest adoption, but we've got quite a way to go. And across the reports, you know that we've studied culture, right? Culture is a strong predictor of software delivery performance. So it may not surprise you that when we were looking at security and specifically the supply chain security, healthier cultures, they have a head start. So organizational culture, is the primary driver of software development security practices. When you have higher trust, blameless cultures, then you're more likely to establish the SALSA and SSDF practices. And when I'm saying healthier cultures, what I'm really talking about is generative cultures. So that's character characterized by high trust and a free flow of information. These performance-oriented cultures are more likely to establish security practices than some of their lower trust counterparts. And it provides unexpected benefits besides a reduction in security risks. Better security practices carry additional benefits like reduced burnout. But here's a key integration point. The adoption of the technical aspects of the software supply chain security appears to hinge on the use of CICD. And often this is where these two practices meet in the middle. You run new security stuff in your CICD. So that makes sense. Right? It's a great another example of how these capabilities start to interact with each other. And so when we compared continuous integration and security, we found teams that were both high on continuous integration and security, they had the best overall organizational performance. So having good in continuous integration and good security is a real driver for good organizational performance. So if we step back to our story for a quick second here, you know, we saw in practice that the order management system team had a good continuous integration story, right? What they were able to do was change their application more easily. The continuous integration was building and, test and running tests, but really, they were building their confidence, whereas the website team, you know, without any configuration, without any continuous integration, everything they were doing 
was basically being done manually. Ah, but in both cases, there was still that change approval board, the mysterious and spooky cab that just blocks all your changes and doesn't let you do anything. But cabs don't just appear out of nowhere. You don't just hail them. But maybe there's something more to think about here. Who is on your cab? How many people are on your cab? Who has the final say? What happens when that person goes on vacation? When was the cab formed? How much has it changed since? Does their oversight need to change? Should they review not every change, but every change to a pipeline? I've heard a story where proce after process changes, the cab was no longer on the critical path and only deals with outlying changes. And as a result, deployment frequency increased 800 times. So as we see, again, context matters. Both teams went through the cab. One, it was super scary, and one, it was not. Um, but we have to remember that we only talked about two of those 400 teams. Uh, we only have 30 minutes up here, so we had to like kind of wrap it up. If we would have stuck with it, you know, that story, you would have seen a lot of meetings, negotiations, blood, sweat, and tears. And beer. To yes, and beers, to get to the end of that um, so that it could be fully updated. Um, but now let's jump back to Dora real quick. So this is, oh, sorry. Yeah, can Katie? you zoom it in? Yeah, I know it's really hard to see. All right, these were all of our predictive outcomes that we looked at in 2022. If I zoom in, here you see continuous integration, loosely coupled architecture, and culture, that those are all predictive of better security practices. And these also decrease things like burnout, I think I'll probably use a little bit less of that, and error proneness. And while increasing team satisfaction, organizational performance, and software delivery performance. Now, I'm kind of going to zoom back out here so that we can see them all, but you can't really see them, but they are in the report. And there are all these different things that you could change, but you have to remember not to boil the ocean. You can affect change on your team, but it isn't going to happen all overnight. Remember that change requires investment, and it may start slow, and you will end up reaching that inflection point where you start to see that improvement. Oh, Amanda, we've forgotten something. We didn't introduce the characters in the story. Are there actors in the story? We I'm didn't introduce sure. us. Oh, us. Us. Yeah. Hello, I'm Katie. I'm a senior software um, DevRel engineer thingy. What am I? I'm a developer relations engineer at Google Cloud. I had a title change recently. Who are you? And I'm also a developer relations engineer on the Dora advocacy team at Google Cloud. Um, so. Real quick to wrap up, you know, this was a short introduction to the Dora research, but you can go to dora.dev where you're able to explore and learn how to really put it into practice. You can go over to the publication page where you can access and download the 2022 report. You can also access previous years, and I encourage you to do so. It's surprising how relevant even things from 2014 and 2015 still are. Um, under the research tab, this is where you can see the structural equation models, and the 2022 one should look familiar. So if you couldn't see it on the screen, you can go to that page and dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, and then head over to the quick check, where you can benchmark your team. So it's going to ask you five questions to get started, and then it's going to give you a benchmark, and then you're going to be able to kind of prioritize by discussing three of the capabilities that we've studied. You can look at continuous integration, loosely coupled architecture, and culture. And then that is going to give you a score on those three. And maybe you're going to see that, and it's going to pop out, and you're going to say, I should dig into continuous integration. In case one of those three isn't something you think you want to focus on, we have the capabilities catalog where you can dig into all of those. But if we did look at that score and we thought, oh, maybe continuous integration is the place I should lean in. Each article about the capability gives you the opportunity to see, how do I implement it? What are the common pitfalls? And what I find most important is the how to measure it. That is a really great place to get started with your teams. It has some questions that you can talk through and kind of get an idea of like, how are we doing? And what is one thing we might be able to s take forward to get improvement? And then after you check all of that out and you're like, you know, I'm really looking for opportunities to learn, discuss, and collaborate with others on software delivery and operations, I encourage you to join the Dora Community of Practice. And with that, we could keep talking for ages because we actually only met two days ago. And so thank you for giving us, thank you to the organizers for giving us the chance to be on stage together because this has been awesome. Um, but also the 
the timer says they're going to yank us here in a second. So if you would like to hear Katie give a dramatic reading of the 2022 report, um, we will be hanging out at the Dora booth, so you can come see us. We'll be there anyways if you just want to say hi and don't want to hear her read it, but she is really great, and she is, it's really enjoyable to read. We have physical copies of the book. We also have stickers and other things. Come by for a chat. It was great to spend time with you today. Have a great rest of your Thanks. conference. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. We are now going to take a minute to hear from a few of our sponsors. And as sponsors will come up, we'll hear from them for a minute or two, and then we'll get into our next talk. Our first sponsor is not what I have on my list, but okay, here we go. No, 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 you're good. Nope, nope, nope. Here we go. That's fine. I just want to say the right thing. Oh, no, it is. I'm just a Hey, let's welcome uh, one of our platinum sponsors, New Relic. Here we go. Hello, hello, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Okay. Well, welcome to DevOps Day Chicago. I'm Shadi C. Johnson. Here's my colleague. I'm Leona Dotto. And we are representing New Relic. Got you. <laughs> okay, so really quick agenda, um, just so you be prepared to know what we're talking about. We're going to go into a little detail about what we do, what is the New Relic platform, if you're gamers, any gamers in the room? Okay, 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 you can find out about our game, and then we have some cool announcements. Sounds good? Sounds good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so again, I'm Shadi C. Johnson. I'm a developer relations engineer at New Relic. <laughs> uh, you really don't need to know much more about us, except that Sade and I are part of the uh, development relations advocacy group, which means you're going to probably encounter us uh, blog posting, dev.co, dzone, new relic blog, all that stuff. And also, uh, you're going to find, oh, I get a microphone. Thank you. Hello. Ah, there I am. Okay, and you're going to encounter us, uh, like I said, blogging. You're going to find us giving video tutorials and also at events like this, both speaking on stage and also in the booth uh, just around the corner. Thank you. So what is the New Relic One platform? How many people have heard of New Relic? Oh, okay. That's perfect. I don't even have to explain that much. But for those who are not familiar, we're an observability platform that pretty much collects telemetry data. So think of metrics, events, logs, and traces. We collect all of this to make sure that your application, whether it's written in Python, Java, JavaScript, PHP, whatever the case may be, Pearl. is, yeah, Pearl, <laughs> Pearl too. <laughs> we're trying to make sure that your application is constantly being monitored and observed to perform better. If you want to learn more, if you're not familiar, come and talk to us at our booth. That's why we left this slide kind of blank. Yep. That was, now, we'll, let's talk about the important stuff. There's two things that you may not hear about as much in the booth. The first one is um, you can win some really cool swag. We've got, here we go, light up, light up D&D &D dice. They're not just dice. They light up. They're LEDs. And to do that, what we want you to do is set up a free account. When I say free, I mean it's free forever. Uh, and we won't ask for your credit card, we won't ask for your child's name, any of that stuff, but you set up an account and create a dashboard in that free account for an old 1990s side-scroller. It's Dangerous Dave, we're calling it Data Driven Dave. Games do not like to be instrumented for monitoring. In fact, they hate it. They actively resist it. So we thought, we'll just do the hard thing. We instrumented this side-scroller game with uh, monitoring data, which you can see, uh, it's not on there. Anyway, uh, there's a dashboard that shows you as you play the metrics. So if you can do that, you can certainly do your customer relationship app or your web app or whatever. So it's real easy. You download a GitHub repo. There's instructions on how to instrument it. And if you show us your dashboard, you don't have to play the game, just have to show us the dashboard, you get the dice. That's all it takes. And then if you get the high score during this event, yes, I am telling you to play games during this event. I am doing that. Um, if you get the high score, then you win the sort of grand prize, which is a $100 uh, Amazon gift card and a backpack and um, the bragging rights for at least until the next DevOps days, which I think is Dallas. Would you say instrumenting this is so easy that a 13-year-old could do it? Uh, 
Yes, as long as the 13-year-old is also a developer who knows how to do things in Python. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. It, the, I, I will be honest. The setup is ridiculously easy. It absolutely, the setup of the dashboard is really easy, step-by-step -step instructions. Um, so that's that. So you can win cool prizes and play games. So that's the one thing. The other thing is something else that we're doing uh, as part of a Twitch live stream, which uh, Shade is really involved in. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you for explaining Dangerous Dave. If you do get stuck, come to our booth. We're here to help. Um, so yeah, so we have that game for a grand prize. Please come and play. Um, we have a Twitch live stream on Thursday, so that's tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We're collaborating with GitHub Education to talk about developer operation packages, and New Relic is one of those tools in there. So if you want to tune in, I advise you to do so, just so you can learn a bit more. Please scan the QR code, and I'll see you there. And grand prizes, if you want more money, come to our booth. <laughs> All right, that's Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New Relic. Uh, don't worry about it, just, it's always on. Good deal. Our next sponsor, um, you guys can go across, uh, whatever. Whichever works for you. Our next sponsor is one of our gold sponsors, Circle CI. Thank you. Hey, it's on. Thank, all right, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, thank, please just give a round of applause to the sponsors that are here and the, uh, all the organizers and speakers. Please just constantly. <laughs> Do that. Thank you for all that they do. Uh, so Circle CI, we're here. Uh, we are a continuous integration, continuous deployment platform. If you haven't heard of us, uh, best in class around you know getting your um, uh, continuously integrating your code and delivery and, and all of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, Amanda and Katie's talk on software delivery, uh, the uh, door report, great. Uh, we also do a report uh, that we have been doing uh, three, four years now. I guess probably five now. Uh, that also touches, goes deeper into the actual continuous integration side of uh, your kind of metrics and stuff. And so one of the things that I wanted to kind of highlight real quick uh, that comes in the report, which we can talk about at the booth, uh, is developer productivity is predictable. So definitely come see that, uh, kind of see why it's predictable and how that can work for you. Uh, we're also doing a raffle, uh, giving away Legos. So come stop by the booth. Thanks. Thank you, Circle CI. And our final gold sponsor of this break is Dell. Yay. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> Hello. So how many people here know that Dell is not just a hardware company? Oh, you all are making me sad. You need to come by the booth or check out developer.dell.com. We're mostly here because we're excited to support our community. But the biggest thing actually that I'm peddling today is chocolate. Please come take chocolate. It's actually pretty good. I really don't want to take it home. So really, we're just here to support the community. We're excited to be here. Thank you all for coming. And check out developer.dell.com. Thanks. Thank you, Dell. And with that now, I would love to introduce our next speaker. Joining us, put your hands together for Anna LeBron. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right. Um, so, unsure production incident is not a new topic for many of you here in the room. You either have been in a production incident as an incident commander, like that yay for luck uh, shell like incident that we had, or you are an engineer troubleshooting a specific outage, or maybe you are a leader or a manager who joins production incident to support your team. Whatever role you have had in production incidents before, and if you have been around those situations long enough, you, you probably can tell people approach production incidents differently, right? And I, and I like to categorize them in two groups. The same that we have like two very distinct approach to set up or alarm in the morning to go to work. There is like two very distinct approach to attend a production incident and to join a production incident. So you're going to come across those individuals that maybe love is a very strong word, but like, like production incidents, right? They get excited, like they want to take an active role, like they just like get their adrenaline up. 
And you're also gonna come across those other individuals that you're gonna join if you page them. But production incidents are also gonna trigger some sort of like anxiety and stress, like it's not a fun thing at all. And they're gonna try to avoid them as much as they can. So what I hope to do in the next 30 minutes is to like hopefully give you another incentive to join production incidents. We have learned over the years that production incidents, they need to happen, right? Like if you're in a mature DevOps organization, production incidents are gonna happen no matter what. And they are the great way to learn how a system works. But on top of that, production incidents are such a unique situation in organizations that they are sometimes, they become the perfect stage to develop and to show skills and behaviors that they are very, very important for your career success. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Anna. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I am not from the US. I'm originally from Spain, uh, where I did my engineering degree. I started my career working in aerospace and aeronautical industry in Germany. I used to build ground system for military aircraft. This is actually a picture of me pretending I'm flying a plane, but I only build the system. I don't know how to fly. Um, and that's how happy I was earlier, <laughs> you know, the first year I entered the industry. Um, then <laughs> I went into the, I came into the US and I started working as a project manager in a fintech company called Innova International. Um, and a few years into that role, someone asked me if I wanted to join Cyrelability Engineering um, as a manager, and I joined the team. And I started learning about DevOps, right? And obviously one of the pillars of DevOps is incident response and like learning from incidents. So a few years into working with SRE team, um, I was trained and coached to be an incident commander and to like do incident response. And I actually did it. And it was terrifying for me. And the reason why I'm sharing this journey with you is because it was not in my career path at all to do incident response or to be involved with incident management. Um, but um, it was terrifying. I didn't, have, I didn't think I have the skills. I didn't think I will be even good at it. Come on, I'm a project manager. Like unplanned things, this is not something I will even be good at. Um, but looking back into my career now, I can tell you for sure the last few years that I have been working on this space have been the most successful in my career. And the reason for that is because I strongly believe that production incidents let you develop and amplify a skill that you're gonna need to demonstrate through your career. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today, right? I'm gonna talk to you about like, how does it feel going into your first production incidents? Why does it feel like a failure and the different type of failures you're gonna encounter? And they wanna talk about the opportunity and my new favorite term that I learned this year, which is adaptive choreography. I will talk a little bit about more about that and the competences that lead to career success. Why production incidents are so important for your career and what is preventing organizations and teams and companies from creating a safe space for engineers to like production incidents. And then uh, I will give you a few a very quick takeaways. So first, the chaos, your first production incident. Do you all remember how that felt? that massive outage where the users of your product, they are significantly impacted, your company is losing money. I don't know how it was for you, but for me it was a mix of these two pictures. It was like panicking on one side, but also like many people talking in many different directions without a clear path to follow. And remember, it was a project manager. So not having a plan was a big deal for me, right? Um, Whatever your experience was, it was probably not a pleasant experience. Generally, when I, when I search for like production incidents, like in Google about it, right, words like this come up, right? Like panicking, anxiety, stress. Did I cause the issue? Did my team cause the issue? Some people even get aggressive. They talk on top of each other. Some folks even lose confidence on their skill set because suddenly the mental models they had in their head are not true anymore. There is like a general feeling of failure. 
And interestingly, like failure is a subject that is entangled with the emotion of shame. But not all the failures are the same. Not all of them should feel the same. And definitely not all the production incidents are the same. So let me go through like a few type of production incidents that they are probably very familiar to all of you. And you should feel bad about these ones, the preventable ones, right? Like these are the really bad ones because you had the skill set and you had the knowledge to prevent it and they still happen. For example, you deploy um, a new feature for your application, but it doesn't work for a subset of your customers. And you had the requirements for those customers, you had the test, but those tests fail sometimes. So it's probably one of those failures I'm gonna still deploy to production and something goes wrong. So these type of failures, they feel the worst because it is the type of stuff that is not new. But you're also gonna come across these complex type of failures. And these are the typical, the, the failures that they happen in aviation, right? When there is like a set of events, a set of contributor factors that they produce a failure outcome. For example, you deploy two new services at the same time and they're both putting a string in a specific resource or database, for example, at that resource crash. And although these type of failures are preventable, it is very, very difficult to think on every, every single edge case if you want to move fast as an organization. And then you're gonna come across innovation failures, and, and these are fun, right? This is one of the reasons why chaos engineering experiment exists, to put your system through a situation they have never been before and they are never encountered again. And these are generally exciting, and most importantly, they're gonna give you the opportunity to grow and to learn new things you could have not learned any other way. So whatever failure or production incident you have been encountering through your career, something that is important to think is like there has been leaders and subject matter experts through history that they have been going to these and other type of failures in the past. And yes, they learned from their failures, but also all of them demonstrated behaviors and skills that they let them overcome those failures successfully. So the message that I wanna give you here is that don't let your first production incident to set the tone on how you're gonna be feeling for your next one or your subsequent ones. Because there are a different perspective you can be looking at, production incidents can be looked at. So, and that's what I did, right? After going through that initial chaos, production incidents that caused a lot of panic and a lot of anxiety, I was certainly earlier in my career, like in that second bucket, right? Of like not liking it this world at all. I started to look at production, in different, production incidents differently, right? And I saw this opportunity, and I think this word adaptive choreography really defined it well. So let me tell you the story behind this world, I, I had the opportunity to attend SRECon this year and I saw Dr. Maguire talking about adaptive choreography. And I say, yes, that is what a production incident is and that is what production incident response is about. So Dr. Maguire, she studied cognitive work in high risk, high impact environments and how individuals and teams cope with complexity and uncertainty in dynamic work system. So she defines adaptive choreography and incident response being all about organizing this collection of participants that they are able to very smoothly and fluidly shift between different roles to backfill a specific function in that response. So if there is something that I took out of that conference and her talk is that production incidents are socio-technical systems and humans and behavioral factors play a very important role during those production incidents. So let's go through like just an example of like a typical production incident, right? Like or an incident response flow and see all the different stages we go through, right? Someone call a production incident, something is broken in production. So you're gonna get like a few engineers joining that um, 
the channel, or the call, however you handle production incidents. And that initial stages is very, very stressful, right? There is a lot of uncertainty. We don't really know what's going on. We don't know the impact. Like, who do we even need to call, right? So there is this initial phase, phase of let's try to understand the situation. So you decide to start calling your infrastructure engineer because they're always the one causing PIs. <laughs> you may call your incident commander. Um, you will call your product manager. Maybe you call your executive team. I don't recommend to do that, but you can. Um, and everyone just start talking to each other, right? Like everyone just have their own jargon and like you're gonna have product managers talking about user experience and uh, dollar amount and infrastructure talking about scalability of the containers and the resources, why it didn't work. Uh, and engineers talking about the latest PRs. So all these perspectives, they really need to be considered, right? Um, but they need to be someone that truly simplify the problem for everyone in the room to understand what is going on. Plain words, something that everyone, a product manager, an executive, an engineer can really understand what the problem is about. And, but time is clicking and we start panicking, right? And again, maybe someone become aggressive, who knows? But we need to like really take a step back, look at the big picture, and after multiple red herring, hopefully someone find the solution and solve the problem. So you can tell from this flow, this is not, this is pretty common, usual flow of production incidents. And really resolving problem is just one part of it, right? And, and, and I truly believe that's the reason why at times production incidents feel like failures because we focus on that resolution of the problem and we forgot that entire adaptive choreography that happens before someone resolves the problem. And really for that adaptive choreography to be successful, right, and, and for, for like that flow of collaboration to happen, you're gonna need in the room people that they show high level of empathy, right, the ability to perceive and relate to the thoughts, the emotions and the experiences of others. You're gonna need team players in the room you're gonna have need people that they can work with each other with different personalities, with different perspective that they always provide like just a different approach to things. You're gonna need effective communicators, right? Like being able to take a complex problem and simplify it in a way that everybody in the room understand. You're also gonna need someone to have a positive attitude when we start panicking and things get, get very, very stressful and critical thinkers, right? Sorting among useful and arbitrary details to come up with that big picture perspecti perspective that allow us to take impactful decisions and solve the problem. And then influence influencers, right? Like not those that you see in Instagram, but like people that they can truly transform the shape and the opinions of others. So all these different like skill and competencies are so, so important to successfully flow through like a production incident. But they are also considered the most important skill set, soft skill set that any engineer and leader will need to successfully grow their career. We tend to focus sometimes on just solving the problem, just solve something that is broken, fixing an error, and that's why it feels like a failure. But PIs is just not about the failure. Solution of the problem is just one of the stage. And I recommend to really think on production incident as that adapted choreography, right? Because there is where the opportunity to develop and show those competences are really, really incredibly important for your career. But you can tell me like, yeah, no, no. Still after all you told me, nope, I'm still in that second bucket. I don't like production incident. I don't really want to do that. I can really show that I'm a team player, that I'm a good uh, communicator through my day-to-day -day work. And you can. But just think and remember that production incident is one of the highest pressure situations any organization is going to go through. And during high pressure situation, your skills get amplified and you reach higher visibility. 
Many of the things we are proud to achieve in life, they are the product of our talent and our effort, but also the product of our capabilities to handle pressure. From doing an interview, from like studying for an exam, even giving a speech at a conference, right? There is not a career de defining moment that doesn't include some level of pressure. And although pressure signal uh, stress and anxiety, one of the oldest findings in modern psychology is that a moderate amount of pressure is actually gonna boost your performance. That's why like the top athletes, they perform better in competition than when they're in training. Or the musicians and artists, they perform better on a stage than when they practice at home. In general, the more skilled you are at something, the more you're gonna be able to translate that situational pressure into like a performance enhancing ingredient. You, you probably wanna just so keep like some level of pressure in your life, right? Just to keep it exciting, to build a strength and resiliency. You need to get out of your comfort zone. If you are not out of your comfort zone often enough, it may probably mean you are not aiming high enough. And then the feedback loop, right? Like there is nothing better than failing at something like difficult and meaningful to bounce back and become a better version of yourself. So there is like many things teams and organizations and leaders can do to like help individuals to kind of move to that first bucket, right? Of like, like in production incidents or take more of an active role um, because there exists still a lot of organizational barriers and probably the most obvious one and, and this is probably very familiar for a lot of you is like the company culture. Um, there is a lot of companies that they still have the culture of blaming at someone if something goes wrong or punishing at someone if something goes wrong. Do you think someone is gonna wanna report a production incident if that, if that happened? Probably not. What is gonna help is promoting a company culture that encourage people to share and to discuss these failures in an open and safe environment but at the same time to teach people to take responsibility, personal responsibility. This is what is called like the blameless culture, also like blame aware culture, like that's really gonna encourage individuals to take active roles and to have a voice during production incidents. Building psychological safety is similar, but it's not the same, right? Like you wanna encourage you, your team to take risk and to innovate. It is difficult to do, but it's so, so important. The imposter syndrome, individuals that they suffer from imposter syndrome, like I think they really have a hard time to take an active role during production incidents, right? Like this feeling that you're tricking others, that you're thinking that you're good at your job, but you're not sure that you're even good at what you're doing. Production incidents probably not the best scenario to, to, to those, so you really need to pay attention to that and kind of like support and, and, and help individuals that they have imposter syndrome. And then this is my very favorite one, right? Counting production incidents. Stop counting production incidents. <laughs> like aviation incidents and fatalities, they go down over time. But the number of fatalities per incident go up. If you only count your incident, your incident reports, you're really gonna miss the point. There are way more effective ways that you can measure the quality of your services. And the number of production incidents is definitely not the one you wanna be doing. I know it's very tempting, the data is right there, and everyone wanna see the numbers and, and the curve going down, but, but just not fall into that trap because it's just an excuse to put off measuring some other, other type of product quality for metrics that they truly reflect customer experience. So all these organizational barriers are really preventing individuals from moving into like that, um, that first bucket, right, of feeling good and participating in production incidents. So let me give you like a couple of takeaways to wrap it up, um, the first one is like, when you are in a production incident, when a production incident happens, 
keep thinking that you are in the spotlight. Take advantage of that. Develop skills, practice, so show your peers and leaders what you have to offer. Because production incidents are gonna happen, right? You cannot avoid it. So don't only focus and don't feel you need to only focus on like fixing the problem and solving the problem. Also focus on that entire process that adapt the choreography between individuals, showing empathy, showing like you're a team player that you can like simplify the message for everybody. We tend to rely on our managers or incident commanders to do that for us, but it doesn't need to be that way. Anyone in the room during the production incident can really take that role and can really show those skill set. So don't only focus on the outcome of the PIs, focus on the process. And then the next one, celebrate production incidents, right? Like take that negative feeling out of it. Stop punishing people from like calling production incidents or like reinforcing the failure. Like share production incident with your team members, talk about it, make fun of them, tell stories, right? Because, because they're gonna need to happen. And also like acknowledge and celebrate individuals that they show all those different type of skill set that they are so, so much needed for someone to successfully find a solution to the problem, to overcome the failure. So I have added here the references. There is a lot of subject matter experts out there writing and uh, about this topic. So it was uh, truly an inspiration for like um, this talk. So I wanna acknowledge all that documentation and this is my contact information. So I'm gonna be around for the conference stop by, say hi, um, and thank you so much for having me here. All right, what a great start to the morning. Uh, we got a bit of education, we got some things we can take back to the office and try to implement, all seasoned with the right amount of PTSD. Uh, so, uh, fantastic start. Um, we're up for a break now, um, so we're gonna uh, break and have you guys go and mingle and start the hallway conversation. There are nourishment stations in the food areas. Those will be available all day, so feel free to go and, oh, they're all over the venue, all right. So if you see food and drink, you can have it, basically. <laughs> Right. <laughs> There's no name on it, just go for it. Um, so yeah, so we're going to take a break. We'll have everyone back in here at 1040. So uh, enjoy and we'll get started when we get back.
Jeff. My mic is not on. There we go. Thank you. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Everybody get recharged. Get a little bit of soda or fruit juice or whatever your preference is in your stomach. You can tell I'm buying time to sort of let people funnel back in. Am I work? Is it working? No? Okay. Um, awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our next talk will be by Rizal Scarlett. Hey everyone, can y'all hear me clearly? Do I need to speak louder? Okay, cool. I'm gonna put my water here so it doesn't slip. All right, today I'm gonna be talking about how containers promote equity, uh, ignores the typos. I was like going through the slides. I'm like, oh my God, I put extra S's. But <laughs> ignore those. And also I wanna say I'm really excited to be at DevOps Day Chicago. It's my first one. All right, so I know in tech we like spicy tech takes, at least that's what I see on Twitter. Um, I'm gonna share one of my own spicy tech takes, but before I do, I wanna hear like a spicy tech take from people in the audience. Like feel free to just like raise your hand and then like yell it out. Don't be scared, cause my, okay. You don't all need containers. You don't, you don't need, you don't all need containers. Okay, spicy, one more. Putting more than one app in a container is going to make someone very upset. Oh, yay, one on the side. PHP is fine. PHP is fine. <laughs> so is Perl. I love it. <laughs> okay, here's yours. You don't need Kubernetes. You don't need Kubernetes. Okay, I'm going to do one last one and then I'll share mine. Monolithic services are sometimes okay. That's true. We don't always need a microservice. Okay. So brace yourself for mine. I'll give a little bit of background and context. It's a, it's a little intense, I would say. Um, so I know in um, like 2019, 2020, a lot of tech companies committed to um, like improving or investing in diversity, equity, and inclusion because of like different murders that happened, like the murder of George Floyd. And they're like, you know what? We're going to like commit to DEI. And I was like, yes, that's so good. I'm so excited. We're going to see like more black people in like management and leadership. Like we're going to get like fair pay. We're going to um, have our voices heard at work. But um, some of the initiatives that what I seen happen was like a lot of like changing of names. And I do want to say I'm grateful to that, like we change the default branch from master to main. I will like preface this with saying I'm super grateful for that because anytime I heard someone say master slave, I would give like a little bit of corporate side eye. I'd be like, what? But it didn't really have the impact I think that we think it had, like changing master to main, like that, I don't think it did that much for the tech industry. That's my spicy take. Um, <laughs> And I hope y'all aren't mad at that. Um, I found a um, diversity report done by this organization called Built-in. And from their surveyors, they found that like more than 70% of teams were mostly white. Um, and 39% of women and BIPOC individuals um, reported that their voices, they didn't feel their voices were heard. And now, I think in the year of 2023 AD, it seems like DEI roles are like kind of disappearing, we're kind of like not prioritizing that as much anymore from what I'm um, just um, observing. Um, so just putting that out there. And I think a lot of this stems from the fact that we have the wrong focus in tech. Um, sorry, we, we have the wrong focus in tech. Um, I think a lot of our companies and products are really made to fine tune the lives of those who already have like a head start in life. Like for example, we have like a ton of like different file sharing tools like Google Drive, Dropbox, Box. We have a whole bunch of like code collaboration tools and a whole bunch of like now like AI for developer productivity. And if you know me, I'm always talking about AI for developer productivity. That's like my thing, but I also recognize that that's really a tool for people with privilege. Um, 
And to me, I want us to start thinking about like, where are the tech advancements that are solving fundamental human predicaments? And I know like, I'm not naive, obviously, it's gonna take a lot of work, or it's actually like, probably impossible to use tech to like, solve world hunger or homelessness or something like that. But if we thought even in a more like, narrow sense, um, maybe we could figure out how we can focus on using the current tech we have to help marginalized people. And before, oh, and uh, um, one of the things I was thinking of is like containers, I think, could be catalysts for equity in technology. And before we get super deep into that, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name's Rizal Scarlett. I'm a developer advocate at GitHub. Before that, I was a software engineer. Um, before that, I was a director at a nonprofit called G Code, which teaches women of color and non binary people of color to code. And, I'm now I'm an advisor at it. And I'm also really addicted to social media. So <laughs> if you wanted to connect with me, my handle is Black Girl Bites on like practically every social media ever. Okay. So uh, to, be, to better like explore my thought of how containers could be used as like um, catalyst to promote equity in our industry. We're gonna go over a couple of things. We're gonna talk about equity, equality, and privilege. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what containers are and why we use them. I'm sure people in the audience have like even deeper knowledge of that, but this is just like my, my surface level knowledge. And then we're gonna explore if containers um, have the potential to promote equity in our industry. Um, first, we're gonna start with defining privilege. And I noticed that sometimes when I talk about privilege, people have like a more visceral reaction. Don't, no judgment, like let me know like with a thumbs up, do you feel positive about privilege? Or when you hear privilege, you're like, hey, don't, don't tell me anything about privilege. It's okay, no judgment, I won't like look at you. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, for me, I feel positive about it and I used to get confused when I would be like, oh wow, you're privileged. And people would be like, no, I am not. I actually went hungry for three days. I'm like, whoa, what is going on? <laughs> but I figured out that I think they're interpreting it or people interpret it as like me saying like, you didn't earn your achievements. And like, I completely understand where you're coming from, but that's not what I'm saying or what people are saying when they say you have privilege. In fact, everyone literally has privilege. Privilege. It, to me, it means like you have access to something that other people may not have, and like that's okay. There's all these different types of privileges, like race privilege, educational privilege, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, and class. Um, so, for example, maybe you have a master's degree in computer science. You have the privilege of maybe the hiring managers or interviewers already assuming and understanding that you know how to code, whereas maybe with a self-taught developer, they have to actually prove themselves. So that's just an example of privilege. Um, here's a person who I think doesn't always acknowledge their privilege. Um, his name is, well, his, his rapper name is Drake, I guess. And um, I think, I, I seen in the news that I think this month, he made history as the first rapper to make $5 million in one concert. And I am not saying that he hasn't worked for his achievements. He really has. I can't think of another Canadian rapper that is popular here in the US. But he also has a song called Started From The Bottom, Now We're Here, essentially saying like he started from nothing and now he's like super popular as a rapper. That's not true. Uh, I don't know, if you're a millennial or a Gen Zer, you might remember that he was on Degrassi, The Next Generation as a child. And I think that's a little bit of privilege to be able to navigate the, the industry in Hollywood and then get into becoming a rapper. And then I'll pick on myself, right? I do have disadvantages and privileges. Like when I was a kid, I grew up in homeless shelters. I'm an immigrant, I'm black, I'm a woman. But I also have a ton of privileges. Like, I work at GitHub, like that's a company that a lot of people love. I'm a developer advocate so I can be able to speak on stages like this. I have like a six figure salary, that's a really crazy privilege. I have a family that loves me, I ha have my own house, like these are all awesome privileges that I acknowledge and instead of like denying those privileges, I wanna use it to uplift others and I think that's how people should think about the word privilege. Okay, enough about privilege, now let's talk about equity versus equality. These are words that often get like confused by people. 
Equality is basically saying each individual is given the same amount of resources or opportunities, while equity is recognizing that each person has different circumstances and allocates those exact resources and opportunities to help everyone reach an equal outcome. And I think it's like illust best illustrated with like images like this. I don't know what the relationship of these people in this picture are, but I'm gonna call that the dad and the bro older brother and little brother. So in the first picture, on what side are y'all on? Right side? Um, <laughs> on the first picture, that's equality. And like the dad, he's already tall and can already see over the fence, but he gets a box. The older brother gets a box so he can finally see over the fence. And then the little brother, even though he got a box, he got an equal amount like everybody else in this situation, he still can't see over. He's still at a disadvantage. So on the other side is equity, where we decide, okay, the dad's tall enough, he doesn't need a box, so we'll allocate that to the little brother so he can finally see over the fence and we'll leave the older brother with it. So this just illustrates like equity and equality. All right, let's talk about containers a little bit. I'm sure, again, there's probably experts in here on containers. This is like my, my high level knowledge. Um, the way I think of containers is they're like packages that hold the code for your application and dependencies and all the different settings to make sure that your app works consistently across different environments or computers or servers. So basically your application is going to work the same regardless of if it's on your computer or in like the production environment for something at your job or on your uncle's computer, whatever. It's going to work the same regardless. And for people, maybe you're not a software engineer and you're like, but why do people even need containers? Um, you might have had to say, or you might know someone that had to say, the cringy words, it works on my machine. I hate saying that, <laughs> but I always end up saying it out of defense. Like, uh, let's say like I fixed a bug or I created a new feature and then I'm like, all right, I'm sharing it with a colleague or I'm ready to ship it and they're like, Rizal, this doesn't work. And then I'm like, oh my God, it works on my machine. That's so embarrassing. And basically containers um, kind of solve that problem. And our industry, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks it's embarrassing because our industry has spent years in the pursuit of a solution to basically run and ship software automatically and reliably from one environment to another. Um, also, I realized, I didn't think about this, and y'all probably know this, that it's like parallel to actual shipping containers that we like use to ship stuff, not in software. Like in the 1950s, we standardized the size of containers that are being used in global sh trade, and um, that eliminated the manual sorting of shipments, and now basically you can ship anything you want, whether it's on a ship or a train or a truck, um, it doesn't matter what's the cargo inside. And that's the same idea with like software containers. It doesn't matter what's inside of the application. It can be shipped um, across environments. Uh, a little bit of a history on containers. We started off with, um, I think it's pronounced Sharoot in the 1970s. Um, that like stands for change root. And basically what that did is it like created a newly isolated environment with its own root directory to make sure that software can run in specific environments. Um, we also then in 2000s came out with C groups, which is short for control groups. And these are like resource managers that divide the resources of like CPU, memory, and storage. And they are one of like the building blocks of containerization because they help ensure that containers are receiving a fair share of resources. And then in 2013, um, we came out with Docker and ignore the third bullet, I just forgot to delete that. But um, they basically popularized the use of containers because they, this Docker created or has like this suite and like management and packaging tools for containerization, making it a little bit more accessible for developers. And you might be saying, okay, we learned about privilege, we learned about equity and equality and all of that. Like what does this, and we learned about containers, what does this really have to do with the DEI issues in the tech industry? So I think there's like two main issues for DEI in the tech industry, at least when I think of like women or like black people, one is like it can be hard to get in. We might not really know how to get in, like what are the starter points, we might not even know it exists. Like I didn't really know about software engineering till I was 19. 
And in some places, like people in more like rural areas or developing countries, they may not have like access to computers or as powerful, um, or computers with like powerful, what am I trying to say? With strong computing power. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then on the other side, we may not see a lot of like black people or women in like more senior roles because we might start to feel like our growth is stunted because people are not investing in us as much or we are not feeling as included. And then as like we go, as we stay longer, we're like, you know what, I'm actually just going to quit. Um, so I think containers have enabled us, our, our industry, to create things like Replit and Gitpod and GitHub code spaces, which kind of help with the access of being able to get started if you have like low computing power. I know like when I was younger, the way I had internet was through this thing called Internet Essentials and they, it was like for $9.99 and then they gave us like this little, this really little computer and it like used the internet so slow. I would not have been able to like code on that at all. But, um, or it, you couldn't do anything on it fast at all. Um, but basically, with tools like Replit and Gitpod and GitHub code spaces, and I think Google just came out with IDX, um, these are browser based and they use like less resources on your computer, so it's low computing powder, power. And even with like, I think Replit, you can use it on your phone if that's the only device you have, or on code spaces, you can actually use it on your iPad. And you may notice me like no, talk about code spaces more because I'm more familiar with that because I work at GitHub. Um, <laughs> but then on the other side, um, for figuring out like how you get started with maybe learning a programming language, that can be hard because maybe sometimes there's like a whole bunch of like setup, like you gotta install, like let's say you're trying to learn Next.js, you gotta like run this command and that command and you don't really know how to use the terminal. Things like GitHub Code Spaces have like templates. So like GitHub Code Spaces has like templates for Next.js and Django and Ruby. So you don't even have to like do all the setup. It already has boilerplate code and you can just experiment with the code and change things. And I think that helps to be able to start learning and getting your hands like deep into a uh, framework or language or technology right away. Or on the flip side, let's say you're new on a team or an open source project, um, you can actually configure a lot of these things like in Gitpod and GitHub code spaces to start running and install all that's needed immediately. So you don't have to do the whole like local dev environment setup that can be kind of discouraging for folks. All right. Some things in stunted growth that I think could be solved with containers is like onboarding, being able to get help, and with like deploying code. So just to expand a little bit more, in terms of onboarding, um, it can be like even on day one, I know that I was like, I'm ready to quit. Cause just setting up the local environment with the outdated documentation and I kept trying to ask people, I'm like, this line doesn't work. And they're like, oh, look at the docs. I'm like, oh, this is so frustrating. Um, but like I've seen that GitHub code spaces or other tools like that can kind of alleviate that cause you can just automatically just install all of those dependencies and have the project running so the person can go ahead and like make their full first pull request. And then in terms of like getting help, I think for a lot of people that are maybe just starting out, they're starting in jobs that are in like a remote environment. And I love remote work, but I can see where that can be an issue for some people because it can be hard. Again, I'm just referring to it because that's the one I know very well. Um, have built in tools like live share or port forwarding so people can see like what's going on on your side and be able to help you debug things a little bit easier. And then like we talked about, with containers, um, deployments made e more easy because you can make sure the container has a consistent, or the container makes sure you're having consistent environments and it makes deploying more predictable. For me, when I do a deploy and they're like, you took down the system, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna quit, this is it. So it's really nice to know that there's like consistent environments across each of them. Um, the hard part about all this, I will say, like I'm talking about GitHub code spaces, is like it's easy to use if you are the person that's like jumping into the project and it's up and running. But, but to configure it, I will say it has a steep learning, learning curve because it used config as code. And I often talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, it seems cool, but I don't really know how to like set it up. So I'm gonna like quickly go through like the basics of what you need to know. Um, first off, you need to know the installation. You'll need to also know the execution commands. So again, npm run dev, maybe you all are 
Java, what do you all use, Maven or something? I don't know. <laughs> um, but you, can, you, you need to know those. And then also you need to know the port that you want it to run on. Maybe you want it to be forwarded to localhost 3000, localhost 8000, 1234, whatever and so forth. Um, and I also have a typo here, not component life cycles. I was thinking of components, but um, code spaces have life cycle properties essentially. And these are essentially saying like, um, what do you want, what command do you want to run while the code spaces is running? Or do you want it to run after the code space is created, before, in the middle? So they have like different like stages in the, the life of a code space. Um, and that's where you would put those install commands or execution commands. Um, here's an example of a dev container. I wish I could like point to stuff, but this is one that I made for like a Python project. I have like a Python image and then I specify what port I want it to run on, localhost 5003. And then I say po on the post create command, after the, the, li the not life cycle, after the code space is created, I want it to run pip install. And then after all the like things are attached to the code space, I want it to go ahead and run python main.py. So essentially to run that file. Another example, this is the last example, is like for a TypeScript project, um, I got the TypeScript image and then I say, I want all of this stuff to wait until the co um, code space is fully created and then I want it to, when something is updated within the code space, I want it to run pmpm install and every, after everything's attached, I want it to run pmpm dev and then I also say like, I want it to run on local host 3000. So this is just like a little preview so you can see that it looks a little bit overwhelming but it's not that bad. And I will end by saying, you know, this is only a start, right? This is only a start of like some of my thoughts and ideas on how containers can be a catalyst for, um, for improving equity and technology. And I know this is not like the ultimate solution, but I do think that containers, by containers standardizing environments and using less of your local machines resources, that lowers the barriers for folks with low computing power, low access to coding education, or a tough onboarding process, but I will love to see in the future of us doing a little bit more, like bridging the digital divide by making like internet more reliable and accessible for people in like more rural areas and introducing coding at a more early stage. Like I literally only learned about it until I was like 19. And then also prioritizing like accessibility for developers with visible and non-visible disabilities. There's so many other things that we can be solving um, to help improve marginalized people's lives, but we tend to get really focused on like to figure out like how we can help other people, impactful change for DEI. And that's all I have. Thanks for listening to me. Good stuff. All right, we're going to take a quick sponsor break. Um, so if our sponsors can go ahead and line up. Yep. Perfect. And I think we're starting off with transition technologies. All right. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Need to be doing, you don't want to be doing. So. Uh, with that being said, come by, check out our example. If you have a book, I'd be happy to sign it. We also got a couple extra here. So uh, come by, say hi, and um, yeah, look forward to meeting you. Yes, and John Willis is here too. Everybody know John Willis? Yeah, well, yeah there she is. All right. <laughs> I have some code. Six percent of those words that can be cut out, and it's still the same thing. You like Mario, you like the cart, it's Mario Kart. Uh, the experience was incredibly frustrating. Uh, so uh, my daughter and I open the wedge-shaped box, uh, we pour the pieces out, and we unfold the instructions. Mario's cart should come together in about seven steps. Uh, if it feels like that's too few, that's because it's too few. <laughs> um, you'll notice how Connects does the step-to-step -step diffing here by sometimes changing the color, 
um, telling you, like, he, you know already, it, everything about these instructions feels like documentation that you're reading where it says, simply do this. This will be left as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> or um, <laughs> the, the word that makes you as angry as busted shitty toys. Uh, just, just do it this way. You're like, oh, well, no, 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 no. no. So uh, seven steps is way too few steps. Um, color change, confusing. Um, these arrows, I can't quite tell where the arrows are supposed to be going to. Uh, they're light blue on even lighter blue onto possible studs. Um, what this led to do, what this led to my daughter and myself doing was um, assembling and then disassembling and doing our best guess to what they hoped we were. Uh, going to uh, eventually get a Mario Kart. Once it was built, it's time to chop Mario in half, uh, <laughs> Darth Maul style, uh, and mount his disembodied torso into the cart adapter. Um, I'm not sure Nintendo licensing allowed this. Usually when you're doing kid things, it's the body stays whole. There's a cockpit construction, and uh, they may have been rushed and needing to get the product out, but like, Actually, there's a piece, there's a very important piece that we'll get to in a moment. But don't, don't, cut, don't cut Mario in half. If you do, um, donate the uh, legs to the multiverse, which sorely needs them. Um, <laughs> the company that does well, we talked about earlier, Lego would never do this. Lego would never have you rip, a, the, rip the legs off a minifigure. Um, so elsewhere on the box, we see this motor <laughs> with an asterisk, also in French, I believe. Um, it, the, motor, the, the motor pulls back, allows the toy to be propelled forward. It says, play with me. My box is a wedge. Uh, take me off some sweet jumps. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was the result of playing with the toy uh, my son did and taking it off some sweet jumps. Uh, once assembled, the toy did not withstand the play that it had requested. Uh, <laughs> And it made me angry, and it went into a Ziploc bag, but I thought that I would keep it because it's a good, bad example. And um, I felt like in that moment, I hated it so much that I needed to burden a Midwest audience with it. So other feel like, <laughs> here, it's terrible. Taste this. Um, so yeah, uh, Connects bad, or Connects trying to be Lego and not being Connects itself bad. Uh, one of those companies was sold for $21 million five years ago. Sounds like a lot of money as an individual. Not a lot of money when you're an entire company. Um, the other company last year made $2 billion in profit. So one of them is doing well, and one of them is doing poorly. Uh, we're going to contrast the bad example with a slightly better one. Uh, you said you love Lego, and you already know. This is the Audi Sport Quattro. It lives on my desk when my son is not playing with it, and even when he's rough with it, it comes back usable. It's not just that the product is structurally sound. We should look at the supporting digi digital and physical assets that come with it, because the toy is not just the toy. The toy is everything around the toy. It's a bill of materials. I can see everything that's supposed to be in the box. I don't have to get started if I'm missing a piece. Uh, if I notice pieces are there that aren't supposed to be, maybe those are security threats, I can throw those away, eat them, save them for later, let the kids play with them in a different set. And there's even more of that. There's more of the bill of materials. This, these, are Lego these are the Lego instructions. And down in the corner, customer service with not just one, but two ways to contact them, depending on your preferred communication medium. Um, be still my beating heart. You got a phone number? You've got a website, there's probably chat there to get you uh, immediately into it. But they're saying, if you need help, we're here for you. Not, seven steps, did you not, did you not understand? <laughs> there's more steps, and these are great. Um, when you're starting, you have the requisite parts for every step. Those are detailed. Here's what you're going, here's what you're going to need. Here's what it should look like when you're done. Um, if you're looking to figure out what the scale of the pieces is, are, you can take the Lego piece and measure it against the page. You're like, yep, that's the right one with the right number of studs. It's going to make the model 
look correctly. And once you take the pieces, put them in together as a subassembly, you take that subassembly and you bring it onto your uh, existing model. There's where it goes, there's what it should look like, the colors are contrasting. When they developed the kit, it wasn't a collection of gray bricks. The color change is oftentimes used to make it easier to build, not so much to, uh, not so much for dramatic flair when you're looking at the inside of it. You'll very rarely be looking at the inside of a Lego model once it's built. But it's not just what's in the box. The Audi Sport Quattro is a, finger quotes, retired product. Um, that's what the tiny uh, red says up there. That means uh, there's no way to give Lego your money for this set anymore. Well, yeah, that's, that, that, no, it is very sad. However, uh, Lego still gives a shit. There's a reason that the Kinex instructions that I showed you were photos, and that's because those instructions don't exist anywhere on the internet. Not on Kinex site, not on a fan site, not on some like third party weird Russian bootleg uh, Kinex instructions place. They're, they're nowhere, and so if you happen against, across those pieces in the bag, like I'm, I, I will do when I pull them, fish through it when I'm uh, tired sometimes, and you didn't keep the instructions with it, you're pretty much out of luck. And that's not the case with Lego. With Lego, you know, if, you know what the, uh, if you know what the set was, you can search for it either by name or by when it was made or by its five character um, model identifier, and then they will allow you to download a PDF or download the application and that the uh, PDF is in, and it's a much easier way to build from the pieces that you already have. You're not out of luck if you lose the instructions. Lesson there is make your site useful. Uh, folks will do other things once they're there. This isn't available for sale, but there are so many other sets that are available for sale. Uh, come for the instructions, leave with a new license set. Maybe um, the, uh, the trivia, the first um, of the license set was Star Wars. The second license set was Duplo, um, that bear that hates pants, uh, Winnie the Pooh, uh, started their, uh, <laughs> started their started their beautiful relationship with Disney and then Marvel and then so many of the other fun branded sets. All right, so one of these toys lives in the shame box and the other one is continually upgraded. Um, this is the work of, uh, work of my son. Um, he, he thought it needed some fire and he calls those pures and a, uh, a slight front lift. It's a good one. He's, he's, he's done very well. He removed the spoiler, so not as much downforce, but uh, for, forgivable because he's not uh, Adrian, the F1 designer. Uh, so building these two vehicles reminded me a lot of working with many of the projects and products that I've encountered there. Uh, I work as a developer advocate, and my work often requires quickly familiarizing myself with these and other digital toys. That's a... 10 meg PNG of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's Cloud Native Interactive Landscape. Um, because we have time before lunch, I'm going to do a dramatic reading of all 25,000 projects. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mostly kidding. Uh, as of this morning, it was only uh, 2,130 projects. But I'm not going to go project by project and tell you which ones are good ones and which ones are bad ones. They're all great, I'm sure. Mostly great. But I'm just asking you to think. So the way someone will experience your product, your service, yourself the first time, it has a high probability of being your docs. Um, first off, technical writers exist. Hire them. And when you're writing docs, when you're writing quick starts, when you're doing videos, think of the missing steps. Um, if you can, always add, always add more steps. Give folks, what are you supposed to have after that assembly is together? Um, how does it fit with the uh, other pieces? Um, too often, um, I'm guilty of this, I'll leave breadcrumbs that are just for me and not think of the new user. You're like, oh, have you already aliased this in your terminal? No, no, you have not. Like, give, say the entire word, say the entire command, give it its, give it its Christian name. Uh, we've all seen the world's saddest readmes with a hash to do and nothing further. <laughs> <laughs> Never to be done. No, if you put it on GitHub, that means you're responsible for maintaining it for free forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
It's in the terms and conditions, I, I, I think so. I, ha I haven't read them all, but I have put my code there. It's also in the Arctic Code Vault, which I'm very proud of. But back to the Lego. Uh, Lego has the concept of illegal assembly. And so they tell you, don't hold it wrong. Like, you'll either break the pieces or your model won't end up structurally sound. Um, is it possible to hold your service wrong? Let users know what you play poorly with. Um, be honest about what you don't do and what shouldn't be done and where you're, uh, where you're not great yet. Uh, people will appreciate not getting to the last step and realizing that it's not for them. Uh, if possible, version your docs. The old things are still running out there. Uh, just because you're not selling it anymore uh, doesn't mean that there's not questions about it. Uh, help folks figure out how it used to work, especially if there are breaking changes. Um, help them understand how to get current or how they can port themselves to what's new. Uh, you'll see an incredible amount of success if you make what you're working on extensible by others. Uh, this Back to the Future set I must have built probably 10 years ago. Uh, down in the corner, there is the um, type of set it is. It's set number four, which is a... Um, of the uh, CUSO program. There's a, uh, a community called AFOL, Adult Fans of Lego, and they had put together a community site where folks would tell you the bricks that you needed to build um, the, uh, any set that they could imagine. And so instead of the master builders from Lego building their own, set, building their own sets and telling you how those should work, um, anything that you could dream up could then go online, be voted on, and um, the Lego company saw this and thought, well, we could get the licensing in order and build these sets, and then we can sell them and get all the pieces together, as people would probably appreciate having them, not trying to source them. But um, Lego eventually brings the CUSO program in-house as ideas.lego.com. Um, use your community. You probably have more fans and more users that are outside the company than are inside. Uh, you can do well to promote their hacks, promote their integrations, um, talk about their use cases, uh, help them talk about their use cases. Uh, so after uh, CUSA, Lego set up the Lego Ideas site. Um, does the same thing. The community can propose sets, uh, the sets get voted on, and if they don't violate the wrong intellectual property agreements, the sets might get produced. And uh, at, the, uh, at my current company, Tailscale, we've done very much the same. Uh, our friend who made the Terraform provider, the install script for getting Tailscale onto Valve's Steam Deck, uh, David Bond and Lego Werewolf, super thanks. Um, they made those because they needed them. They're useful. Uh, and the, the company offers to maintain some of the open source that um, folks are using. It's frequently welcome. Many folks made projects, integrations out of necessity, not wanting to maintain it forever. And so if you find things that folks are using, even if they're outside the bounds of your uh, fence or garden, um, bring them in, promote them, and oftentimes um, that will be uh, something that the company itself can use and uh, sits in your own repository. Oftentimes it doesn't matter whose it's in, just that it's happening or that you can point to it. Again, you don't necessarily want to be maintaining everything that you've ever written and put up on uh, GitHub forever. Uh, this one is a Lego Ideas set, uh, if you're a fan of the portals and the Valve. Um, I really hope that Shell and uh, the, the subject number, what was it, 284? I should have put it in the speaker notes. Uh, enjoyed both the video games. We'll try and buy the set when it comes out. May have more toys for you from Valve later. Um, I'm getting hungry at this point, and so I think it probably goes into speed run mode. Um, talk was just as much for me as it is for you. Uh, C.S. Lewis or someone said that uh, we don't need to be reminded, and um, hopefully you feel, hopefully you've felt extremely seen or even personally attacked. In which case, we can <laughs> try and do a little bit better together. Uh, finally. It's not enough to make parts that fit together. The work is empowering others to play. So put love into your docs, put love into your community, bring people, uh, bring people in, look and see what uh, folks are doing with whatever it is that you're building, 
and help them do more of that. Uh, I'm Jeremy Tanner. This is the top view of a very special Lego brick, the 3x3. Three three. It also happens to be the logo mark of my capitalism dad. <laughs> it gendered it male because it's evil, but that's fine. Um, capitalism, not tail scale. Um, so at Tailscale, we help human scale teams easily build trusted networks. Um, we are hiring, particularly in engineering, marketing, and sales. We're over at Jackson 19, back there. Uh, I said there would be more Valve. Tomorrow's raffle is a Steam Deck. Yay, Valve! Enter today. We are hosting a happy hour with Jelly after the conference today. Please find me to talk Lego, infrastructure, rally cars, patent law, mesh networks, or pizza. Thank you. You are both seen and attacked <laughs> at the same time. So, job well done. Uh, the other thing that always bothers me about documentation is like, when they remove it, it's kind of like low-key shaming, right? It's like, well, what are you looking for that version for? <laughs> I'm not running it. This is just for historical purposes. Right? I just, clearly I wouldn't be running a version that old, but, you know, and then it's like, you know, did you really need that 10 megs, right? Like, did, did you really need to save the storage on that? That's why you guys pulled it off the web? Thanks. Appreciate Thank that. Um, all right. We're going to move on to our sponsors. Um, I know we're a little early, so I don't know if we're quite lined up yet. There we go. All right. I see some activity. I hope. Nope, she's sitting down. <laughs> Sponsors, I think we're looking for Postman up first. All right, well, while we're waiting for them to come up, um, today has been great so far. I've already had some amazing uh, hallway track talk, so I hope you guys are participating in that. When you When you see a group of people just sort of talking about something that you're interested in, just sort of jump in there. I was having a great conversation, then I got uh, interrupted by the conference and had to come up here and introduce people. <laughs> so that was a bit of a pain, right? So I uh, would love to have that conversation around collaboration a bit. All right. While we're uh, collecting our sponsors, um, but we might as well start explaining lunch that will be right after this, so that's fine. So that'll save time. So after the sponsors have their thing, then we'll go right to that. I was making so, sure they didn't rush out. No, 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 exactly. Hold on. Oh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. No, wait.
Okay, as people are making their way in, we're getting ready to do our ignites. Come on, we can get some more folks in here. I know there's more of you. Food was good, but it wasn't that good. Come on. I mean, no, I'm just saying, it's, it's nothing compared to what you're about to see, is what I'm saying. Also, we gave you an extra 20 minutes, so it is okay. We'll get, we'll get going in one second. Um, just to talk a little bit through the way the rest of the day is going to go. So we are going to be starting with our Ignite speakers in just a second, and I'll talk about that in a minute and introduce them. Following the Ignites, we'll have a, spo a quick sponsor break, and uh, in fact, I wouldn't say it's a break. We just will hear from the sponsors. And then we're going to start open spaces, so we'll explain how they work. We'll do our open space uh, topics, and then we'll spend then the rest of the afternoon will be a mix of going to the open spaces as well as the two workshops that will be happening in this room. So, Ignites. Ignites are a uh, not required part of DevOps Days, but it's a convention. We like our Ignites. It is definitely a required part of DevOps Days Chicago. And the Ignite format, um, you know, some people say, oh, we're doing lightning talks. We're doing whatever. No, this is an Ignite. It is a very specific format. And guardrails and constraints bring us power. The constraints of an Ignite talk are you get 20 slides. Those slides auto advance every 15 seconds. You do not have control over the deck. And you just buckle up and you just go. And all of our Ignite speakers are amazing. And they're going to blow the doors off of this. And I can't wait to hear from them. And they're going to go one right after the other. So I'm not going to stop and introduce each one as they go. So I will go ahead and they're going to all introduce themselves. And at the end, we'll bring them back up again and get a great big round of applause. But feel free to clap as much as you want constantly throughout the entire thing. So with that, we're going to bring up our first speaker. And Jackie, when you get yourself up there, we will get started. Buckling up. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Hello, friends. I am Jackie Grinrod, and I am a senior developer advocate at AWS. I am a top 30, under 30 developer from Canada. I am a fourth time DevOps Day speaker, and I also have ADHD and anxiety. And I want to tell you about the day that I learned I could not keep those separate from my work anymore. It all began the day that my doctor called me and said, he didn't really know that much about this ADHD stuff, but he was done prescribing my medicine to me. I was stable, I didn't seem like I needed it, and you know what, I was being successful in tech. But it actually all started eroding right then. Easy became exceedingly difficult. It culminated in a technical team meeting that was booked over lunchtime in the kitchen by somebody who knew the situation I was going through. And the sounds, smells, and movement gave me sensory overload and in front of the entire engineering team, and I mean all of them, like not just my team, everybody, I was chewed out for my lack of focus. I was shocked. Moment, there was nothing, nothing that I wanted more than to be able to focus, I'm shaking. <laughs> So ADHD is more than just your inability to focus. It is also anxiety, it is insomnia, it is lack of appetite, and it is a lack of ability to have short and long-term memory. But it's not all bad. In fact, we're very creative and we excel at using our intuition to solve comp complex problems and debug in complex sy systems that you might not normally be able to find. So that's pretty cool about us, at least. <laughs> its core is about building its core is about building core is about building core is about building core is about building cultures processes and tools to help come together to build something that is better than just the sum of its parts it's about collaborating while we continuously iterate and improve and help to build something better tomorrow has anyone else here had to be a team of one it's pretty lonely huh well i learned that by reaching outside of just my immediate circle I could find people that were solving similar problems to me and I could learn from them. And one of the things I learned was to work with my brain instead of against it. The first thing I learned was bodybuilding. In fact, it's so easy, you might already be doing it without knowing. It's just when you sit in a room with somebody else, work. you both work on your own tasks and it's great, it's productive, right? So years later, I moved across the country and for six months, could not get after. I could not get medicine that I had been on for over a decade. <laughs> I know, right? I'm wincing too. And I found a situation, except that my, my coping had not scaled with the work that I had, which is when I found out about accommodations. And I did this 12-week coaching program for people that had problems like me. 
and I learned all kinds of new processes for how to deal with these things. And you know what? Learn I did. I found all kinds of new things, like how to do body doubling in a remote virtual environment. Sometimes I took time-lapse videos while I worked on my blog posts. And I also learned other things, like how to deal with my anxiety when it became too much, when it became too much. I also learned how to disrupt, disrupt my environment. Whether it's your local dev environment or the, the desk that has your keyboard and your computer on it. Sometimes when things aren't working, you just need to know that it's time to change it up and your environment management is critical. That's also how I learned a bit more about setting myself up for success. Um, I've got the QR code, there's a few of these throughout the talk because it's way too much in an Ignite. But I did things like allowing myself to bring my speaker notes up on stage with me and these five second heart timers that tell me how far I am into every slide. It turns out task batching isn't just resource friendly for computers, it is for us too. You can do things by grouping small tasks and like items together, and that takes off the cognitive load. So maybe that means I'm going to do my emails at 5 p.m. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> that also brings us to day theme and blocking, which is pretty much just a bigger version of task, task batching. Maybe you look at a day and you say, I have all these tech de te technical debt tasks that I need to work through. Maybe I have a lot of training that I need to do. Setting them up in one day reduces that cognitive overload. Have you tried reframing task completion to time completion? Sometimes tasks can feel really big and overwhelming, but if you split it up into five to 10 minute intervals, you can assess, hey, is this going well? Do I need to switch to a different task today, right? And if you want to learn more about DevOps from me, because five minutes is a really short time to talk about ADHD and DevOps, here are about 20,000 words that I've written on what is DevOps and DevOps essentials, if you check out those QR codes. To leave with today, is that different people learn differently and each problem has different solutions. But that's a good thing. That's how we build more robust systems and processes. That's how we build a better tomorrow. So you're never alone. It is just a matter of finding the right path. I knew I was gonna cry on this slide. <laughs> but no matter how hard it gets, another day will dawn and you will continue to iterate and improve tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining me today. That was, that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, Jackie. That was really brave. Um, that incredible Ignite. Lucky me. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Hannah Foxwell, and I'm going to be sharing five product management practices that every platform team needs to know. Here we go. Here's my slides. We're kicking off. Uh, but first, why am I talking about well, over the past five years, five or more years, I've seen a lot of teams try and struggle and sometimes fail to launch internal development platforms on Kubernetes. The worst of these experiences burnt through lots of time, lots of money, and they burnt out their engineers. And by seeing what works and what doesn't work in the real world, I've learned a few lessons and I've come to believe that product management practices in platform teams can really help set teams up for success and set those platforms up for success. And you do not have to have product manager in your job title to use some of these tools and techniques to set yourself and your team up for success. The first piece of advice I'm going to give you today is can you tell me why you're building a platform in the first place? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Too many platform engineering teams that I've spoken to can't answer that very simple question. So once you've established your why, why you exist, why you're building a platform, go and find your users. And when you find them, I'm going to suggest something really controversial now, you're going to talk to them. You're going to get to know them. You're going to understand their problems, their pain points, their and you're going to seek to solve those problems. You're going to look for real life problems to solve so that you can deliver value, so that you can delight your users who are probably the developers in your organization. Do a little bit of research about how to conduct a good user interview and ask open questions. Try not to ask leading questions and try not to bring your idea of a solution into that conversation. Just be open-minded and be curious because what we do when we build in a vacuum is something that you know I refer to 
field of dreams, engineering. If you build it, they will come. We invest a lot of time in building things and we don't validate that we're building the right thing. Which leads me on to my next piece of advice, which is that time is money. And it's as true today as it was in 1748, when this quote comes from. Um, my next piece of advice is simply being more intentional about how you spend your time. Do you build or do you buy the solution to your problems? Because the IKEA effect is a thing. The IKEA effect is actually a cognitive bias where we all naturally place higher value on things that we partially or help to create ourselves. And this isn't just about flat pack furniture. It will refer to custom solutions that you built in-house in your organization or open source projects that you've contributed to. It's really normal to place place higher value on those things. And you'll need to fight that bias. You'll need to fight that um, intention to always place higher value on those. There's also a lot of hidden cost in custom solutions, whether that be the ongoing maintenance or whether that is knowledge silos within your organization or whether time for new employees. There are always hidden costs. So be really intentional about build or buy. So. My next piece of advice, what else might your users need to be successful with your platform? The documentation and education is actually of the user experience. We have a lot of empathy with the users of our platform. Because they are engineers like us, and we know the difference between picking up a new product or technology and it comes with really, really good quality documentation. It makes a huge difference to how easy that product or technology is to use. But you don't have to start from a blank sheet of paper. You can pick up the best available content that's online and you can signpost your users to it. And then you can just augment that with the things that are very specific to your organization and your platform. Now, my final piece of is once you've built your platform and you've documented how to use it, you need to get out of the goddamn way. You need to drive towards self-service because guess what? Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all the other cloud providers are asking you to create tickets or interact with a human to be able to use that platform, to be able to use that product. And so to scale the impact that you're going to have internally, you need to get out of the goddamn way and drive towards a self-service model. You need to treat your users like any other technology platform would. So, to wrap up, uh, the five product management practices that I recommend that you take away if you're building an internal development platform. Understand why you're building the platform. Go and get to know your users. Be really intentional about whether to build or buy the solution to your problem because time is money. You need to include the documentation and education is as part of the user experience. And then finally, you want to drive towards self-service and get out of their goddamn way and so they can be successful without you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was amazing. Um, so my talk is all about designing APIs that stand the test of time. I am going to be talking all about what it means to building APIs that last for a time and I have some really interesting tips and tricks. So if you don't know me, my name is Pooja Mystery. I am a developer advocate at Postman and Postman might be a familiar platform for you. It's used by 25 million developers worldwide and it's a very critical um, tool. So when I think about designing APIs, there are two uh, questions that come to mind. The first question is, am I creating the right API? And the second question is, am I creating that API right? And these two questions are really critical when it, and it dictates whether you're going to have a good experience or a bad experience, regardless of the API you create. Whether that's a partner API, a public API, or even a private API, a good experience is going to dictate usability, and then a bad API experience is going to relate into disconnect. So with disconnect, you know what this means. Your front end and your back end are not connecting. Who's been there? I don't know. But uh, yeah, so you know what that looks like. But there are a couple of things that you'll need to focus on when it comes to API design. So those three things are purpose, usability, and evolution. 
So these three are focuses are ones that I think are the most important when you think about how to create APIs that last. Uh, let's dive into purpose. So when it came to purpose, um, my colleague and mentor Arno and I decided to create this API that was very near and dear to our heart. It was all about When's the next slide coming? Okay. Well, it was all about it was all about coffee. Okay. So coffee is uh, really special to me, and um, I d we decided to create an API that allowed users to select three things. So it allowed users to select their bean type, their milk type, and their roast type. And what this kind of gave us is that basically an API is first and foremost an interface for people. So ultimately, we needed to create one that allowed people to resonate with it and. It, it was, it's not just a pluggable thing, it's something that's uh, reasonable. And now when we talk, about um, a lot of usability is one of the key factors into creating and designing your API that'll last a while. And one of the key factors of that is, uh, that you'll see with usability is uh, consistency. So we've all seen this triangle, right? It's available on so many different things. We have them on play buttons, on YouTube. When we look at this triangle, we know that means play. Similarly, we want to create APIs that are so consistent that they're almost predictable. And the place to do that is naming. So naming is often overlooked when it comes to APIs. And this is where we can apply consistency the most. We can keep our names consistent, our query param parameters consistent, our path parameters consistent. Required, not required. Require the least amount of information possible and you'll reduce time to first call. So how fast do you want your users to get to that 200 request? If you require a million different things for them, they're not gonna get there. Error handling, who's seen this page before? Almost everyone, right? You got a 400 request, says to go look at the server, what does that even mean? So uh, this is so important when it comes to building APIs that give proper error handling. So you probably can't see this, but this is my coffee API. We had um, someone post the bean request, but they spelled bean wrong, they put Ben in. So I'm giving them a 400, but not only am I giving them a 400, I'm telling them exactly what went wrong, where it went wrong, and I'm also telling them that their roast type, yes, they can choose a light roast, and unfortunately, we don't have that milk. We have whole milk and almond milk and oat milk. So, just what, so with your error messages, make sure that you're sending information that the user can take from. And of course, every good uh, API is going to evolve. That's what makes an API stand the test of time. So evolution is key to creating APIs that are long lasting. Uh, one place where evolution exists is data modeling. So within data modeling, you have a lot of different um, aspects of where your API can evolve. You might need to change your strings into objects at some point, and also keeping your schema consistent with what kind of data and standardized. And then of course, documentation is often overlooked as well. Keeping documentation update, up to date as your uh, API evolves and makes it easier for your users to understand what kind of features are available and what they can do with their APIs. So with that, if you want to learn more about APIs, Postman, come to our booth, um, say hello, get some socks, and uh, just you know have a great time at this conference. Thank you all. Have a good one. I'm Sophia Stratton and I'm 11 years old. I have three dogs and love playing basketball and softball. And I probably know more about DevOps than you do. <laughs> I gave this talk last year at DevOps Days Minneapolis and I'm sharing it with you now too. This is my emotional support stuffy Wolfie. He also knows a lot about DevOps. This is my dad, Maddie Stratton. He has been talking about DevOps my entire life. I'll be talking about what I think DevOps means after listening to my dad talk about it all the time. And I mean all the time. <laughs> First of all, my dad says that DevOps is the acronym COMS, which stands for Culture, Automation, Lean, Measurement, and Sharing. John Willis, where are you? This makes no sense. <laughs> First is culture. I think culture means history and how it all began. 
Did the ancient Egyptians use tabs or did they use spaces? <laughs> I searched on dictionary.com to see what automation means. Wolfie, do you know what this means? Because I still don't get it. <laughs> Here are some images for the word lean. What does this have to do with Kubernetes? Also, <laughs> what is Kubernetes? <laughs> When I think of measurement, I think of baking, which makes me hungry. How do I get continuous delivery of brownies right into my mouth? Mmm, <laughs> brownies. Sharing means to let other people use your stuff. But in that case, there is no DevOps in my house. Zero. Let me, I don't think that really helped. Let me see if I can explain this better. I have a lot of talents, but software isn't one of them. But I have made lemonade stands, so I'll explain that for DevOps. One of my favorite ways to explain something is using an acrostic. This is when you take letters of a word to make more words to describe it. Here's one for DevOps. D is for deliver. This is about getting things to the customer quickly and what they need. Like we take lemons and sugar and deliver a refreshing drink. E is for empathy. Empathy means understanding other people and what is important to them. So on a super hot day when people are speeding by, you understand that they might be thirsty and need a refreshing drink. V is for value. In DevOps, we want to make sure what we deliver helps people. For example, the people getting lemonade from me get value. Otherwise, they'll be dehydrated on a hot day and maybe pass out on the sidewalk. Maybe this is cheating since ops is already in DevOps. O is for operation. This is about how we run things or fix them when they break. In the lemonade scene, we want to make sure we have enough ingredients and don't run out when we need more. And if we do, how are we prepared? Speaking of prepared, P is for prepared. This is about how we run things or fix them when they break. In the lemonade stand, we want to make sure we have enough ingredients and don't run out when we need. <laughs> Finally, we have S. I have heard from my dad that the most important part about DevOps is something called, let's just say, S H I T, posting on social media. <laughs> In fact, this whole talk came from a silly post on Twitter. Thanks to the 2,000 people who like this who brought me here today. You know, I was promised Europe, and I ended up in Minneapolis in Chicago. <laughs> I didn't even get to go on a plane. I never understood this one. But now that I saw all of your talks today, <laughs> I totally get it. Thank you for listening to my talk. One last thing to remember. Today, I've heard a lot about infrastructure as code, but I like infrastructure as Cody better. You know, I would love to be here again next year. What do you think, Dad? Hint, hint. Let's get all of our Ignite speakers back up here for one more round of applause. Let's hear it for... Let's hear it for Pooja, Hannah, Jackie, and Sophia. Thanks so much, everybody. You did awesome. Look at all these people. Excellent. All right. Now the talking is done. Now it is time for the open spaces. You guys can, you can, you can, you can exit soon. So, very organized. All right, so for this, I'm going to bring up uh, someone to help us introduce these. Uh, Dan Frosty Mayer, who is uh, 
I'm DevOps Days organizer. He's one of the core organizers for DevOps Days globally, and we're going to kind of go through and uh, talk about how we're going to do this, and we'll set it up. So, oh, yes, we have sponsors. Okay. You just chill here for a minute. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so our first sponsor is... I'm waiting for you to put the slides up. I believe it's Site 24-7. Oh, our platinum spot. Wow, I am really sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Welcome our platinum sponsor, Site 24-7. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm uh, from Site 24-7 team, managing in Site 24-7. So Site247, it's an AI-powered full-stack observability platform that helps you monitor your entire infrastructure from one single console. Yeah. So here, <clears throat> if you see, we provide monitoring for all layers, starting from the end-user layer where we can check whether your websites are up and running from outside your network, from over 120 plus locations across the globe. We have REST API monitoring, so you can make sure whether your REST API calls are working, synthetic transaction monitoring, ISP latency monitoring, you can identify the latency in the network. And then server monitoring, it's a physical uh, server monitoring, so you can monitor your Windows, Linux, Mac OS, for critical performance metrics like CPU, memory, disk utilization. Uh, you can monitor close to 60 plus metrics with our uh, server monitoring. Cloud monitoring for AWS, Azure, GCP. And then application performance for your Java, .NET, Ruby applications. So you can help your developers identify performance issues at the code level. So we provide the traces uh, when the errors and exceptions occur. You get stack trace, which helps you uh, pinpoint exactly in which line of code the error has reported. And then network monitoring, monitor your network devices like your routers, switches, firewall. And then we have real user monitoring, measure the performance of actual users in real time. When they access your website, what is the performance experienced by them? And then we have log management included within the product. So when something happens, instead of running behind different teams to get the data, you can have all the data in one single page. So it makes the troubleshooting part easier. You can fix issues faster. And then we have CloudSpin. It's a cost management tool, a FinOps tool. Currently, we support it for AWS Azure. So you can cut costs on how much amount you're spending on AWS or Azure. I read an article where uh, AWS makes most of its money from idle instances and uh, underutilized resources, right? So Site247 can help you understand or identify those resources which will help you in spending lesser amount on the cloud services. And Status IQ, a cloud-based uh, uh, status page where you can communicate incidents with your clients and customers easily. Customers expect us to be proactively communicating th with them on in any incidents that are happening. So that can be done with our Status IQ product. So Site247 as a whole, we give monitoring for both your front-end and back-end infrastructure from one single console. So the application layer and infrastructure layer can be monitored from the same product. So it would be easy, again, as I said, when there is an issue, instead of running behind teams to get the data, say, if an application is down, I want to go through the logs. Instead of asking my logs team who manages them, they will have a, their own tat, the turnaround time. Like, let's say, if it's two hours or three hours, I have to wait for that time to get the logs to analyze the issue. But when using a product like Site247, you have all the data in the same product. So think of the time that you are saving and how much, because every, semi, every second counts when it comes to a downtime, right? Every millisecond counts when it comes to a downtime. Because when we talk about downtime, it's not only about the business we lose when customers are not able to access our application. There are a lot of other uh, costs that are involved. Let's say, for example, if there is an infrastructure failure, you have to replace that infrastructure. That's a cost involved. And if there is an outage, you're going to have an engineer work on that outage. A developer is going to fix some issues. A time is spent there. So there is a money involved. So a lot of factors, uh, cost is involved in outages. So we should be in a position to understand exactly where the problem is, 
how fast we can fix those issues. So that can be possible with a powerful tool like Site247. So this is a sample dashboard of Site247, where from one single view, you get complete visibility into your infrastructure. This is customizable, where you can just drag and drop the widgets. You can check your application performance, network performance, server's performance, everything from a single dashboard. So that's it from my end. Any questions? OK. So we have our booth there. Uh, we have some uh, giveaways, and we are also having a raffle for the Bose earpods. And for all the attendees here, we give a six-month free subscription of our product, a fully functional evaluation, no commitments, no need for you to put any credit card or something. You just sign up, you start using the product, and you will feel how powerful the product is. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Our next sponsor coming up is going to be Sleuth. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron from Sleuth, and Sleuth is an engineering efficiency platform whose focus is to empower development teams to shift faster by making engineering measurable and easy to improve. How we do this is by giving you your baseline using Dora metrics, and then highlight bottlenecks in your process by higher tool chain. You control D, issue trackers, issue trackers, issue trackers, and trackers, and trackers, and uh, workflows, so you enhance those uh, automations that you can sh quickly ship in order to uh, give improvements, and then, of course, the metrics to understand if you're doing well or not. Um, if you're interested in getting better visibility into how your engineering teams are doing and you want to ship product faster, please come talk to us. We're at booth number one uh, in the Franklin Gallery, and we're also giving away three $100 Amazon gift cards. So if you want to win one of those, please come over and chat with us. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. And last sponsor in this spot is Retrative. Hey everybody, thanks uh, for just taking a minute. Uh, I'm Jay Clauser with Brightiv, and uh, at Brightiv, you know, really to make it really simple, we are in the business of making identity and access management in the cloud much easier for you. So we are a multi-cloud permission management system. Uh, kind of the unique thing about Brightiv is we do everything on demand and in a temporary fashion. So as you need access, we provision it, we provide it, but then we, we uh, eliminate it at the end of the day. So uh, in the end, you know, a lot of the challenges, whether you're a, a platform engineering team that's trying to provide tooling to your DevOps uh, teams to, to make them efficient, uh, whether you're an identity and access management person who's worried about long-standing keys and tokens and, and orphaned accounts, come talk to Brightive. That's really what we solve. And we do this across AWS, Azure, GCP, OCI, Snowflake, and the list goes on. So if you are looking to take control of identity in the cloud, make it easy to use for your DevOps folks, but also put the proper security guardrails in place, that's what we're here to do for you. Um, we are over in the booth. I think it's the, the one across the way. I think that's Jackson. Uh, right as you come in the door. So we're also doing a, uh, a giveaway, one a day, for a custom pair of Nikes. I think there was a gentleman in the blue back there. His head just popped up. I was back there. He has a custom pair of Nikes. So if you want to design your, design your own Nikes, come by. You'll have a chance to do that. But uh, appreciate the time and look forward to uh, talking to some more uh, folks today. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's try this again, Dan. Yeah. Hey, it's time for open spaces. So it is time for open spaces. It is time for open spaces. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan. I am one of the co-chairs of the Global DevOps Days conference series. I'll put the mic closer to my mouth. This sounds very serious. Uh, I have done open spaces around the world. We have been doing open spaces at DevOps Days since the inception of DevOps Days in Ghent in 2009. Although I am French, so I pronounce it Gant. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mais c'est vrai, hein? C'est vrai. Dans le monde me manque, si jamais vous désirez parler français avec quelqu'un, c'est moi. Bon, voilà. But it's time for open spaces. Quick question, show of hands. Uh, I always ask this. How many of you have done open spaces before? 
That's more people than usual. Fantastic. We're going to whip through this. So here's the deal. Everybody that raised your hand, you have now volunteered for a very, very important responsibility. And that is to help all the people who did not raise their hands to have a good time. I see you. Can't back out now. So open spaces, how do they work? What are they? In a nutshell, it is an opportunity for you to have a discussion. It is an opportunity for you to curate your experience to learn from your peers, to ask hard questions, and to get good answers. It's a DevOps stage tradition. If you're thinking to yourself, I, I don't know how this is going to work. I'm a little bit scared of that. I don't want to talk to strangers. It's You've fine. got questions. It's We've fine. got answers. You, you ruined. You ruiner. <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> fine. Let's just get to it. There are four rules. <laughs> and one law for open spaces. Four rules and one law for open spaces. The rules are important, the law is primordial. Let us go through them. Here is the first rule. Whoever comes are the right people. What this means is, is if you've got an idea, and you're like, yeah, I've got an idea, this is the thing I want to talk about, and I know that there's like one or two people, really specific people that are here, and I'm 100% sure that they have the answer, and I really want them to come to my open space, and they sh you show up at the open space and those people aren't there. Guess what? Because of this rule, whoever shows up is the right people. All right? So the people that you're there with are the only people you could be there with, and they are therefore the correct people to be there. If this sounds weird, it's because you've never done an open space before, and once you do one, you'll understand what this means. Whoever comes are the right people. Accept who's there and, and accept the experience, right? The next rule is whatever happens, happens. Okay, now is it a tautology? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. But what this means is that, again, you, you came into it with some preconceptions. And maybe those preconceptions didn't play out. Well, guess what? That's still a success. No matter what happens, it was a success. All right, positive mindset, positive frame set, super, super, super important. Whatever happens, happens. And whenever it starts, this is the next rule, is the right time. Also, whenever it starts is when we tell you it starts <laughs> <laughs> because we have to stick to a schedule. But really what this means is, is don't wait for everybody to show up. If the open space starts at nine o'clock, just show up at nine o'clock and start talking. Right? This is the most French DevOps day Chicago has ever been. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you show up five minutes late, well, that was the right time for you to start. And if you show up 15 minutes late, that was the right time for you to start. Whenever it starts is the right time. And of course, to follow that one up, when it's over, it's over! Okay? Now, of course, when it's over is when we tell you it's over because but we are But it could be over before frame. then. But this is what's super important. If you're not getting anything from it, if you're not contributing and you're not receiving, and you're like, eh, I would rather be doing something else, then it's over for you. And that's okay, which leads us to the one law. The law of mobility, all right? This is super, super important. I make a jokes and I make light of the other one, but this one is super, super important. And this is, again, if, if you're not, if you're either contributing nor receiving, then you have full permission to get up and go somewhere else. It's not an insult. You're not going to hurt anyone's feelings. In fact, if you're just like, you know what? I got, I'm going to go check out another open space. I'm going to go check out a workshop. I'm going to do hallway track. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Whatever you need to do. There's no insults. There's nothing wrong with people moving in and out, moving around, working in other open spaces, chatting. That's just how it is. That's how it works. It's a lot of mobility. We're Midwesterners. We feel very strongly that it, against being rude and things like that. All the, so it's okay. It's not rude to, to go and dip because that's encouraged. That's what yeah, we that's do. It. I'm French, so pfft, whatever. <laughs> uh, and this is also super important. It's neither a rule nor a law, but this is something that we have added over the years here at DevOps Days, uh, where we've been, again, been doing these open spaces for a very, very long time. And that is, in the words of Nathan Harvey, bring your best self, all right? And the idea is, is to come into this with an open heart and an open mind and, and really be ready to partage, share. 
Yeah. <laughs> My English is good. Maybe not that good. Uh, be ready to share and, and be ready to contribute and be ready to, and maybe your contribution is to just sit and listen, but listen actively, listen with intent, right? That's really, really important. Bring your best self. Excellent. There we go. So, so how do we, yeah. how does it work? Do you want to do this part? I'll do this part. Okay, you do this part. I'll do this part because I tried explaining this yesterday at the organizer summit and you told me everything I was doing wrong. So yep. again, he's French. Um, Actually, that's more just he's frosty. All right, cool, but here's how we're going to do it. So think when you think of a topic, a suggestion of something that you'd like to discuss, you, maybe you say, hey, I want to talk about Kubernetes in a healthcare environment. Maybe I want to talk about you know, how I can manage AGHD in my tech career. You know, maybe you got inspired by something we talked about earlier. So you're going to write your suggestion on one of these sticky notes that Albert is demonstrating here. We'll be running around. We'll get some of the people in the red shirts to help run Sharpies and stickies and stuff around. So you're going to get your suggestion. You're going to come up and you're going to line up here. Okay, and then one at a time, you're going to come up here, I'm going to give you the mic, and you're just going to say, this is my suggestion. And uh, it's great as actually to say, hey, my name is Maddie. My, I mean, only say that if that's your name. You know, but, or not, that's cool. And then we'll say, for example, so I'll get up there and say, hey, my name is Maddie. I want to talk about, you know, Kubernetes, Kubernetes in the space program or whatever. And then I'll say, we'll sit there and say, okay, show of hands, how many people would be interested in that? It's not a commitment to raise your hand at that point. You're not saying you're going to go. We're just trying to figure out, like, what size of room, you know. So if it's, like, 100 people are, like, damn, I want to talk about that. We're, like, that's going in the big old room. If there's, like, a few people, we're, like, cool, we got some smaller rooms. And it's important, though. It's not a commitment. We yeah. had a question yesterday, which is how many times am I allowed to raise my hand? You can just leave your hand in the air the whole yeah, time. Yeah, as many it's times. Fine. If it sounds interesting to you and you might want to show up for it, that's all you got to do. Um, and then uh, after we get and we'll put them, stick them over there, and then we're going to work together to assemble the schedule. The way the rest of the afternoon goes, we have three slots of 30 minutes each in uh, a handful of rooms, more than a handful, quite a few actually. So we'll have those slots and here's how this is gonna work. During the time of assembling the schedule, which is gonna start pretty shortly. If you have a strong belief and you wanna be involved in that, why would you wanna be involved in that? Maybe you say, hey, there's two open spaces I really wanna go to, I sure hope they aren't at the same time. But you don't have to be involved and it, it, it sounds like complete chaos and ridiculous and it actually massively works. And then we will publish that schedule. So if you want to go ahead and either shoot this QR code here or go to that bit.ly, it's going to take you to basically right now what's an empty Google Sheet. But that's where uh, the whole schedule will be. We'll be publishing it in various places. But that way you'll, you'll get that. And we'll keep this up on the, on the slides during the uh, planning process. Yes, sure, great, awesome. 25? Oh, 45. That's even better. Open spaces are 45 minutes long. Okay, cool. And there will... Yeah, yeah, we'll do the two. I think we have two and then a break, or one, it's all, it's all on schedule. Anyway, cool. So if you, uh, I, I will also say this, because in the interest of not everybody likes speaking in front of everybody and stuff, so if you're like, hey, you know what, I have this thing I want to talk about, but I did not sign up to get up on stage and read into a microphone, you can absolutely just give the post it to me or to Dan, and we'll, we'll happily read it for you. That's totally fine. But the point is, you still have to come up here and bring your post it, so we're ready to go. So... Uh, if we have some, oh, let's go ahead and start getting in line. We're going to get going. We got also, 20 this is minutes super to make important. this all work. So. This is super important. You're not coming up and giving a talk. Yeah, yeah. Also, that's the other thing. Okay. Free, yeah. you know what I think? <laughs> don't, don't hold the open space up on the stage. Uh, just come that's up and say doing. the thing you all want right, to talk so number about. Number one. All right. Hi, uh, my name's Jeremy. I'm really curious on how we could brainstorm on how to apply CI, CD processes to things like system on modules, microcontrollers, embedded development in general would welcome anything like feature flag management or Kubernetes type info too. Excellent, okay, and then go that way. Chris, you, want to, you can write. Okay. How many people would are interested in that uh, feature flag development? Yep, generally speaking, hands up. Which, where do we put it on this? Oh, I'll put it on the white because it'll stick there better. Uh, I think it's small. Okay, next. Matt, have you ever lost your database? I never lose my database because I use a product called Pivot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, topic uh, run databases in Kubernetes and uh, when you should run, when you shouldn't run, uh, why you would even consider this. Databases in Kubernetes, show of hands. Uh, oh, it looks, I'd say large probably. Okay, cool, next. 
Hello, beautiful humans. My name is Jen. I'm at Ivan with Maddie. And uh, I want to talk about mental health and neurodiversity in tech and talk about how we can make it more normalized and start associating more tech into making it normalized. Mental health and neuro. Okay, this looks like a large. Go ahead, next. So Maddie, I'm the guy who will forever be known as the guy who got called out by an 11-year-old. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm working with a, a vendor as a part-time, just helping get started, and they're trying to do a modern-day CMDB. And I've been interested in this idea for, I've been doing this for 40 plus years, of how come we can ever get a CMDB that works in our industry. And, and so just in a cloud-native world, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. It's not going to be a vendor pitch or anything like that. Just is if there's interest in what does a modern configuration management database look like? Modern CMDB. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'll just let you judge. Okay, next. Hi, my name is Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should do it now, right? Yeah. Um, hi, hi, I'm JJ. Uh, every DevOps days, I always offer this one, and I'm going to offer it here. Uh, we all have a home lab, right? You know, we always play on, have our own little sandbox and all. Also known as Plex Ops, let's become Plex friends and uh, maybe talk about the cool stuff we do at home. Home Lab Jam. Okay, and Chris. All right. Hello, my name is not Maddie. My name is Tarun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to talk about GitOps tooling and processes. GitOps. Okay. Uh, me medium large. Okay. Hi, my name is Rishi, and uh, I'd like to discuss advocating and publicizing infrastructure wins across a company. So, like, actually getting people noticed. Okay. Uh, medium, large. You've got questions, we've got answers. Explaining cultural catchphrases and sayings in an open and non judgmental space because I had to Google where the heck that was from. It's 30 years old. <laughs> Help each other get smarter about jargon. Looks uh, pretty big, medium. Hey, my name is Chris. Uh, I do a lot of value stream and dependency chain mapping. If you've ever heard of Wordly mapping, I do a lot of that. Uh, this is specifically mapping DevOps to SRE on the platform value stream. So I'm going to facilitate that. Um, not a 101 talk if you've done the cup of tea talk with me before, but this should be General audiences, everyone's welcome. Hope you can make it. Okay, value stream on the SRE2. Did I get that right? SRE2 DevOps or the other way around? DevOps to SRE value stream mapping. Okay. Got that, Chris? Other Chris? Okay, yeah. There we go. Uh, what's up? My name is Dex. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, migrating an analytics program to a modern data architecture and a modern data stack. Show of hands. Okay, looks Dex, small, medium. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop proposing this one when you all stop coming. Let's talk about docs for DevOps and why you will all hate Confluence. Uh, nope, I got another one. Oh, yeah. Do you remember how much that is? Yeah. You got it. Uh, Slack Ops, how we can do lazier uh, operations and make them more better. -er. I do. I, I'm paid to professionally grammar. Yes. <laughs> All right. Next. Uh, I want to talk about all things APIs, testing, development, design, automation, and I hope to have all people interested. Get it? API. Ah. Okay. Hi, I'm Jimmy Redussell. I'd like to talk to you about our telemetry system support group. We all have problems with this. I'm merely an author, I'm not a vendor. Let's help each other out. All right, telemetry system support group. Looks small, but might get bigger. Okay. Hi, I'm Mike. I want to talk about how for the last 10, 15 years, we've made everything too fucking complicated. And <laughs> And I want to go back to talking about how we can make things simpler. So if you want to talk about like actually doing good work and solving customer problems and making things simpler, let's do that instead of just you know sit there and play with Kubernetes all day. So. 
<laughs> no. How to make things simpler. That looks like a large. Uh, from working with computers to working with people, um, transitioning from engineering to developer relations, developer marketing, this is like an open ask to help me do that. One of the, okay, you got that one. Okay. Okay, Scott. Hello, I'm Scott. Uh, I'm going to call this integration testing for infrastructure changes or how I learned to stop worrying and love pushing to prod. <laughs> <laughs> how I learned to stop worrying and pushing to prod. Okay, it looks like uh, medium large. Okay. All right. I want to talk a little bit about failing fast. So how can I justify to leadership that I'm about to substantially change or even abandon a bunch of work that I'm already doing that's just not going to work and I know it? <laughs> there you go. Okay, that looks like that's a pretty big one there. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Ray Myers, my session's on AI and legacy code because people are telling me that AI can write code now, but I didn't hear anyone saying that they're having trouble shipping new greenfield code. Everyone's saying the problem is we've got all this code already, so is it relevant to that? Thank you. How many people are interested in that? I was trying to summarize. Okay, medium, small. Okay. Time management and prioritization of issues, so how to get your team to recognize that there's an issue coming up that they could solve before it becomes too big. Preventative prioritization of issues. It's like a, probably a small. Hey, um, we are into accelerated delivery. So what are the what are the things that could improvise for that? I am thinking it's GitHub Copilot is one of them. Anybody is interested in discussing? <laughs> Accelerated deployment delivery, yes. Show of hands, give or take, small, okay. Conway's Law states, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. I would like to discuss how we can use that to build the social structures that build highly reliable systems. Making Conway's Law work for you. All right, pretty big. Hey, thanks. Hey, I'm Josh. Uh, I want to talk and hear from people about how you're using the Kubernetes API and CRDs to manage all kinds of platform and infrastructure capabilities. Kubernetes API and CRDs. Okay. Hi, I'm Drew. Hoping to discuss time management and being overwhelmed by multiple bosses or wearing multiple hats. So daily strategies. Okay, you got that one? All right. Albert? Hi, I'm Albert, and I'm interested in hosting an open space to talk about restarting DevOps meetups locally. All right, talking about getting the DevOps meetups and meetups related to DevOps going again. Okay, looks like a smaller medium. Hi, uh, my name is Maddie. I mean, Tom. Uh, I want to talk about uh, declarative infrastructure. The, the limits, the edge cases, the benefits, and also how to make this simpler. So our hands. Okay. All right. And now, next, Gabriel. Hi, I'm Gabriel. Uh, I'd like to talk about DevOps for Web3, running community open source blockchain nodes in production. DevOps Web3. Small. There's those hands that's happening. And Jeff. I told you I love open spaces. My arm's tired. I'm raising it nonstop. Uh, creating good onboarding and training for junior engineers in a remote environment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we got one more. Oh. Hi, I'm Matt. Platform engineering. Let's talk about it. Platform engineering. <laughs> open ended. All right. Okay. So that said, I think we've got our suggestions. We're going to start working on the schedule. I wasn't doing the math and the counting. It's possible we have more suggestions than will fit in the slots. If that's the case, it's cool. We're doing this again tomorrow. So we may roll some things over. And additionally, as you're having your conversation, by the way, and if you want to help with the planning, go right ahead. I'm just talking now. So we got about 10 minutes before the first one will start. So if you want to help with the planning, come on over here. If you don't, go get yourself maybe a coffee or a drink or a pop or a Swedish fish. Nope. No, let's do that real quick. Okay, so on the map, hold please.
dramatic effect. Okay, so you will see, uh, so if, if you haven't seen this already, this venue is laid out in a big circle. So the good news is, if you feel like you get lost, just keep going in the same direction, you will eventually end up where you started. Now, uh, there are various rooms that the open space will take place in. So right now we are in a room called the hall. So if we orient ourselves this way, so going down, if you go around there, you kind of bring around, you'll go, there's a big room down there called the hub. That's one of the largest open spaces. As you go around, you will find different rooms. Some of them are smaller boardrooms, some of them are larger. They all have names like Adam's Gallery, or Adam's Gallery is on here like four times. <laughs> Even smaller, oh, the smaller ones I can't, oh, yeah. There are also, all of us in the red shirts can help direct you where you need to go. You will see uh, there are two big rooms, uh, Forum North and Forum South are split up together, um, which are kind of the keys of that, but you will find your way as, as we go. Make sure you grab a link to the schedule so you know what will be happening when it happens. And again, when they start is when they start, and we will, um, yeah. I had a different point. Oh, yes, and again, do not forget that throughout this venue, there are various stations. Now, I know, again, we're all polite Midwesterners. We're sitting there going like, man, that, that prop is behind a door. I probably shouldn't take that. That would be rude. No, take it, drink it, enjoy the soda and the coffee that is finally, finally we're having a DevOps days where the coffee lives up to Kevin Reedy's requirements. So it's only taken us almost 10 years. Uh, so definitely help yourself to that. See sponsors as you're going around. Head into the open spaces. Um, I believe there is nothing in the first. No, no. Or the other thing you can do is at or the first open space starts at 2.15, which is in about 15 minutes. The other thing happening in this very room is Doug is going to be talking about automating away SRE toil, not automating it to make your toil even more which is what I kind of said the first time. So that will be happening, that workshop will be happening in this room. And go for it, that should be it. Yes, oh yeah, we will be do. oh, that is what I was gonna say. As you are, we are gonna again, we're doing this again tomorrow, we will do this ceremony again, we just won't explain it as much, but if you're having a phenomenally good chat in your open spaces and you're like, ah, oh, damn it, it's over, there's no reason not continue them again the next day.
right, we're going to get our workshop, first workshop of DevOps Day Chicago 2023 rolling. We got Doug Sellers coming up here. Uh, Doug, why don't you take us away? Cool. Can you guys hear me all right? Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming, to, coming to the workshop. We're going to talk about automating away SRE and DevOps toil. Uh, Maddie kind of had that confused a little earlier. Um, so I'm Doug. Uh, we're going to do a workshop here. We can be as interactive as you want. If you want to pull out a laptop, I've got a bunch of docs that we can go through. I'm also going to do it live up here. So if you just want to follow along, that's also totally cool. Um, so let's just go right into it. So the, the inspiration for this workshop came from this blog post. And this blog post is a, this person wrote a blog about managing SRE for gambling websites. And you know, our goal is to keep websites up. But if you're running a gambling website, like their whole goal is to take money away from the people who are showing up to the website, right? I apologize if any of you work for a gambling website, but that's, I mean, that's sort of the goal, right? Is people come in and they put money in and then you try, you win most of the time. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, it's a 13 minute, the, the link is here, if it's a 13 minute read time. Uh, the too long didn't read is document everything, right? If you write it all down, w every single issue that's ever occurred, you figure out how to resolve those issues. And so in this blog post, uh, they walk through how they did this. And what this person did when they started in their role is they went through the last two years of priority issues. Everything that had come up, they had 1,700 issues that they that they that had arisen from this, you know, tickets that had, had come up. They categorized them and they created a runbook for each of those issues. And so a runbook, you know, here are all the steps to resolve this issue. Um, step by step, we're going to figure out the process. So when this happens next time, boom, 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 we can walk through the steps. We can resolve the issue. And that's what he, you know, and this is the what they found when they wrote all of these runbooks, when they created runbooks for the 1,700 issues that were there, is they found that now that they had a walkthrough for everything that happens, they knew what to do. So they could, res anything that came up in the future, it got resolved faster because, you know, it was already documented. Here are the steps to follow, you know, when, when things are all stressed out and you have, like, just a checklist to follow, it's a lot easier to solve the problem. Um, escalations were a lot easier because it was all documented, right? You know, I'm a DevRel, so like I'm a big fan of documenting everything and making sure it's really easy to follow. If every single issue has been documented and, you know, this isn't working, now we need to call John or Susie, you know what to do. It's all written down. They found that when they hired new people, it was really easy for them to onboard because they're like, we've documented everything. If you're curious about this, you know, read, read the runbooks. Um, it was great training for the folks. And the team was really dis became really disciplined about it. When they found that there was a runbook, when things changed, they went back and they updated the runbooks so that everything was up to date. I mean, that's always one of the problems when you document everything. If things get dusty and, you know, aren't accurate anymore, then your runbook's no good. And so as the team found that these runbooks were making things easier, they started spending like 10% of their time actually updating their runbooks. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is taking these runbooks and taking it to the next step and adding some automation into it so that, you know, there's, you can either do it inter an interactive automation, but all the code is there. So there's no issues with making mistakes because it's, you know, the code is already written um, and not in that high stress environment of an outage. Now, the, the guy who wrote this post, uh, when he started his job, he didn't have to do any other SRE work for seven months. He just created run books. Now, of course, um, none of us have seven months to just like stop all of our work and just, you know, we're going to document everything and, not wor and let everybody else deal with the outages and then, uh, you know, then we'll be good. Um, so if we think about that, um, that's in seven months, 1,700 runbooks, that's 243 a month, 11 and a half a day, if you figure 21 days, working days a month, uh, or 1.4 runbooks an hour that, uh, that they created. Um, we've got 40 minutes 
So let's try to do two. We'll try to create two run books in the next, you know, 35 minutes or 40 minutes or so. Um, so the, we're going to use a project called runbooks.sh. It's an open source project. Um, I work for Unscript. We're building on top of this, this project. Um, it's open source. It's runbook automation. And so it's based on top of Jupyter Notebooks. Has anyone here used Jupyter Notebooks before? All right, so a good show of hands. Um, it's Python based. Uh, it's stepwise code. The other great thing, well, we'll walk through it. So it's all online. It's collaborative. So none of this, I have a script on my machine that will solve this problem. It's all online. Everyone can access the run books once you've got them created. Um, it's Python. So um, no disrespect to the people who love YAML or any of these domain specific languages. It's Python. Lots of people understand Python. Pretty straightforward uh, programming language to build stuff with. Um, in Jupyter Notebooks, you can add code segments, but you can also add documentation segments. So you can actually write out in text or markdown. The next step does all of these things. You know, here are the parameters. You can document it also that you know when you're running that next segment of code in your Jupyter Notebook, what's going to happen or what's expected to happen. Um, and the great thing about all this is it is Python. It's scripts. You can automate them to run the entire run notebook automatically, or you can do it interactively. And we're going to do a bunch of interactive uh, notebooks here in, in, in this workshop. Um, so one thing when I've talked to people about using Jupyter Notebooks, there's always a concern like, well, I'm going to be interacting with my cloud. How do I deal with all of the credentials and all of the, you know, the security aspects of you know, logging into, into my AWS account? And what we've done with runbooks.sh is we've put a secure credential storage on top of the Jupyter Notebooks. So your credentials are secure and uh, stored away. And you can build your runbooks and connect straight into AWS or into you know, all the cloud things that we generally use. Uh, we've got uh, hundreds of built-in runbooks and actions. We call actions the steps inside the runbooks. Um, and so it's all open source, um, and we'll get into that in a second here. Uh, here's an example runbook. Um, each one of these steps is, we call it an action. They're all drag and drop in. These are all created. They're part of the open source repository. And you just set up the configuration. You, you wire in, in this case, your Kubernetes or your Slack Credentials, you wire in the inputs, and the outputs come out and tell you what's going on. Um, right in here is a little bit of Python code that I wrote, right? So I got the logs, and then I need to look at the logs. And so I you know, wrote some Python code to automate exactly what I wanted to post the message to Slack. And when you post it to Slack, the idea with this one is that, hey, we, we're going to get some information about the health of our, of our Kubernetes pods, and we can post it to Slack. So if there's something wrong, someone can go in and, and work on the issue. And of course, this runbook is part of the open source as well. Um, so we've got about half an hour, and let's just go right into it. Um, one thing that uh, the guy who wrote, the, who did the 1700 runbooks, he did not have our secret weapon that we're going to use to help us go a little bit faster here. Um, we're going to we're going to use ChatGPT to help us build some of our runbooks because, you know. If you're not working in the collaborate AI somehow into your tooling, is it really 2023? So, you know, we're going to do a little bit with ChatGPT as well, just because it can help us build things a little bit faster. So if you want to pull out a laptop and follow along, that's awesome. Otherwise, I will just do it, uh, in, you know, uh, here in front of you all. Um, but it is open source. We do have a Docker install, but it's... You know, as they said at the beginning, we want to be respectful of the Wi-Fi, and we don't want everyone downloading, um, you know, Docker builds. So we have a, we also have an online free trial, um, so you can try out the uh, the Runbook automation uh, at the Bitly link up there. And then I also have a a worksheet to help us walk through it um, at Bitly, uh, D O D Chicago C H I. Is anyone going to do 
actually log in and do it, or do you want me to just, you know, there's sort of like an extra delay if someone's going to actually walk through and, and go for it. Anyone going for it? Show of hands. All right, well, we'll just go through it slowly up here, just me. Um, when you sign up for our, uh, for our free trial, all of the credentials are stored in a, in a proxy. And uh, the first runbook we're going to run is we're going to fix a Kubernetes uh, pod that, is in the, uh, that isn't running properly. And so when you sign up, you have to set up a proxy. You name your proxy. Uh, we're going to, when you sign up with the free trial, we also set up a Kubernetes namespace with a pod in image pullback off state. So we're going to give you a credential. So you set up that credential, and then we're going to open up the runbook and just go right at it. Um, and so what's happened here is when you sign up for the free trial, we're going to set up a Kubernetes pod that's in the image pull back off state, and we're going to resolve that issue. And so at this point, I'm going to go straight into the runbook. If you are interested in doing it, the uh, instructions are in the Google Doc to the, to the right. And this is really small, so I'm going to see if I can see it here. <laughs> um, but when you open up one of our runbooks, it looks something like this. And so over here, this is our Jupyter notebook. And we have uh, sections with code. And then we have text sections. And so this one is describing what this runbook is going to do. Um, and so the first step that we're going to do is we're going to get a list of all of the pods that are in the image pull back off state. Is that big enough, or do I need to go bigger for you guys to see it? It's OK. All right. I'm seeing some thumbs up. OK. And so um, in this runbook, there's an input parameter, and that input parameter is called namespace. So you can run these like an API as well, right? So you can run this as an API with the input parameter namespace and just run this automatically. In this case, we've got a namespace, and it just has this UUID as the name. Um, the first step of the runbook is to find all the Kubernetes pods in the image pull back off state. We can look at our configuration here. We have our credentials set up already. And that's just given to you by default in this case because this is a Kubernetes pod that we've uh, given you to get started. And then um, we're going to look for the namespace namespace, which is the variable. So it's all stored in a variable. And when we run this, it's going to come back and say that this, uh, this pod here is in the image pullback off state. And so we need to fix that, right? We can't have our pods in, in, a, in the wrong space. In, in, you know, we need them up and running. Um, this is also the demo for when you sign up. So we have videos. Um, you don't have to watch the video. That's just me talking um, about what I'm going to do right in front of you. So that's kind of cool. Um, the next step we're going to do, oh, one other thing I want to show you here, is in this configuration, the output of this action is saved in a variable, the image pullback off pods. So in this next one, we will take that, the image pullback off pods, and we're going to create some uh, kubectl commands. And so this is just Python to create the command um, and to get all of the events, uh, get, to get the com the com create the command to get the events uh, from the logs. As we scroll down, we're going to extract these events. Um, and so again, the configuration we're, um, to our uh, Kubernetes. And then we're going to, um, in this case, this is a list. So we can iterate over the list. So if we had multiple pods that were in the image pull back off, we could iterate through that list. And we would get all of the events for all of the pods in case there's just one. So it's just going to iterate once. And we can run that. And so we've run that. We've now extracted the events. And so what we're doing here is we're just gaining the information that we need so that we can figure out what the problem is and then resolve it. Um, 
this next one is just some Python to examine the events. And when we run that, um, what we find is that uh, we misspelled our image, right? It's Divian instead of Debian. And so uh, is, as a part of this automation, we've now figured out what the problem is, and now we can start going into uh, remediating the problem. And so that's this last step. Um, and the way this works is uh, we're going to build the last steps of this. And in this case, we need to run, um, we're going to add an action here. And this is just, where did it add it? I don't want to add it there. I want to add it here. All right. Um, we're going to add an action. And what we're going to do is we're going to define the patch command to fix the problem. And run that. And so we've defined a variable called patch command here that's going to fix the problem. Now we need to run some kubectl commands. And so to do that, um, we can just um, cube. I can't even see my screen. Cube. Right, so we have these built-in actions. And you can drag and drop them in. And in our configuration, we'll set it to connect to, um, to Kubernetes. And the command we're going to run is just patch command. Apply those changes. And we run it. And of course, it failed because I probably spelled it wrong. Say again? There we go. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. So we've patched it. Thank you very much. And then the last step is um, we're going to run one more kubectl command right here. And we'll see that we've resolved the issue. So we will here. And then our command would just use an F statement here to like check our namespaces. And it's completed. Like, so we resolved the issue. So the idea here is we've built an automation just by dragging and dropping these built-in actions. We've built a runbook that helps us resolve this Kubernetes issue that we were having. And, uh, you know, there's lots of things that we do every single day as SREs, as a, as a DevRel person, that if we could just build some really quick automations, auto we could just take that off of our plate as a, for a daily, as you know, part of our daily process. And we can, you know, we all have bosses. Why didn't you get to this? Well, I was busy fixing all the other stuff that was broken. If we can automate some of the stuff uh, that we have to do daily, we can uh, work our way through away from, you know, that daily toil, automate that, and then work on the things to actually improve our systems. All right, so that was the first run book, and we did it actually in pretty fast time because, uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, oh, I didn't. So I, I forgot to walk through the steps. Sorry about that. Um, but we walked through all of this. We uh, looked for the. We found the name of all the po found all the pods that were in the image pullback off. We extracted the events. We examined the events, and then we fixed the pod. And so by automating these steps, uh, we now have this runbook. The whole team has access. We save it. The whole team has access to this runbook. Next time something like this happens, we can resolve it automatically. Um, all right, so now we have about uh, 20 minutes, and this one is we're going to look at um, JIRA tickets, because we all have lots of JIRA tickets, and we're going to look at them by, uh, by their label and the status for the last week. And we're going to build a runbook from scratch. We're going to do it probably, we're going to extract the tickets two different ways, and I'm going to show you two different ways that we can do that um, using a runbook. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up a new tab here, and we're going to create a new run book. Um, actually, really quickly, um, to design this run book, I actually asked ChatGPT, how would I design this run book? And um, so I said, hey, I want to create some run books to solve common SRE tasks for DevOps professionals. 
Um, and I'm going to focus on Jira use cases, and then I just describe what I want it to be. I want it to be in Python, in the style of a Jupyter notebook, you know, with Python code to solve each step of the problem. Um, and then we're going to create some data that we store in variables that we can reuse and continue this process. And, you know, ChatGPT told me, said that, you know, I'm brilliant. Um, it's always really nice, like, and then it, then it totally tells you lies later on, right? Um, uh, we've all played with chat. I assume everybody here has played with ChatGPT. Has everyone here played with ChatGPT at least a little bit? Yeah, all right. Um, it's really fabulous. It will generate code for you, and 80% of the time it'll work. <laughs> it's, the, it's that 20% you have to be really careful about. And so um, what I'm going to show you is a way that we were actually built some of that into our, our notebook product so that you can, um, in, so you can actually generate some of these actions uh, with a chatbot. Um, so I said, you know, hey, I want you to get me all of the JIRA tickets for the last seven days for a certain project, and then um, figure out how many, for each label, tell me how many issues, and tell me how far we've progressed with all of them, and then let's graph it. Um, and I said, sure. Um, you can actually see, I, I, in, the, in the doc, I've shared, um, you know, it gave me a list of all the code to write, and it broke it into steps, right? It's all Python code. And it actually, this code, you know, pretty much, you know, once you put your credentials in, it actually, it works. It does the job, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, as, I, I've, as I've been complaining, I said, like, I can't read what you gave me, so you can make the, the fonts bigger in the, in the graph, and it did that for me as well. Um, but it walked through a bunch of steps. So it, it created a runbook that had four steps. One, retrieve all the issues that were created in the last seven days from Jira. That's pretty straightforward. It, it created a JQL query for me. It, it did all the code. Um, it then took all those issues, grouped them by label and status. It gave me a plot. And then it said, now we're going to send the image to Slack so that you can report it to the team. And like, great, this is exactly what I want to do. Let's see if we can actually do it. Um, so let's create a run book here. Man. And so we're going to create a run book here and we'll start editing it. So there's two ways that I'm going to show you how we can extract the um, extract the uh, uh, the tickets from Jira. One of them is um, we're just going to search for search Jira. We already have an action that does this for us, and we can set a configuration. If you're following along, I did actually put in uh, the way to set up the credentials here. You can add a credential and um, I gave you a URL and um, an API token to do this. Um, I've already done that. So I've already got the credentials in here. And then um, the JIRA search is, uh, is there. So it's for the project DevRel and created in the last seven days. We apply this. We say, give me a list of all the tickets. And it says, there are all the tickets. Um, if we go into the code here, um, what it's actually doing is it gets all the matching issues, and then what it's returning is just um, the key in the summary. It's not actually returning the data of the ticket. In this case, I want actual all the ticket data. I want to get the labels and all of those things. So what I can actually do is just have it um, return the matching issues. Right? It's, it's Python code, so if you don't like the responses, if you don't like what ChatGPT gives you or what anyone else does, you can just go in and change the code because it's, it's Python and we can make those changes. And so now it's going to return that data so I can reuse that data. Um, I want to call the, the, that data, I want to call all of the issues issues. So I'm going to put that into a very, the output of this 
action, I'm going to call it issues so that it, it'll just run and it'll go. And now that's stored in the variable issues so I can follow the next steps to continue on. Now another way we could do this um, that I think is actually really cool uh, is we've got a, we've got ChatGPT built into, um, into our tool. So we can actually say, I want to create a JIRA and I say, and I can actually say for the, for a project and over the last X days, generate a list, return all of the issues. And you can actually ask it to do that. It will generate it for you and then you get the code uh, for you. So if the action isn't there already, with just a few minute, with just about a minute using chat GPT, you can actually get uh, the code written for you. And it works pretty well. Every now and then chat GPT does hallucinate on you and it does forget a variable or it makes an error. But because it is chat, because it is a chat, you can just put the error in and it'll say, you know, well, this error happened on line 31. You send that back to chat GPT and it'll fix the error for you. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, I've been generating a lot of, of runbooks and actions and code with different cloud ops providers uh, with this tool and it works really, really well. Um, we can skip right past that because I already have the list of all of the actions. Um, waiting for a chatbot to come back is, it's a little dry watching that happen. <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's, it's actually really fascinating to be able to like pair program. I mean, uh, has anyone else written code with their ch with ChatGPT to try to get things? You know, um, it's actually really fascinating how quickly it'll do things for you, and it, you also learn very quickly about how dumb it is as well. Like um, when you talk to AWS and you're like, "I need this EC2 instance," it always forgets to add the region. Like EC2 instances, it needs to know the region as well. So you just kind of learn its foibles and how to work with it to make it, uh, to make it work with you. Uh, but it does solve the problem very, very quickly a lot of the time. Um, so now we've got all of the issues from the last seven days from JIRA, and now we want to chart it. And um, well, actually, let's just go to ChatGPT's code here, right? So it gave me all this code. And it says step two is um, count the issues by label and status. So we'll, let's just see what happens. They're calling it issues, so I think that's right. Um, I'm going to create an action here. And we're just going to put in the code that ChatGPT gave me. And it ran, right? <laughs> that's pretty, pretty crazy. And then the next one is... Um, plotting the data. So can we, you know, so I said, hey, we've got all these issues here. Um, let's go through and actually plot the, it, it the way I asked uh, ChatGPT to do it for me. And, right, like pretty phenomenal that I could, you know, I said, hey, I want this to go. They said, here's the code you need to do it. Um, generated a couple steps and you know within just a few minutes we can actually have a working example where we have this this chart being built for us um, I did actually then if you look uh, at the bottom here I said hey I can't read the plot so can you give me a bigger version of it and so let's just go back we can edit this code I don't know if I copied that I don't think I did whoops And it, I think that made it bigger, <laughs> but it made the font bigger so it's easier to see. But like we're generating, this is one of those things that I, I know I get asked this a lot, like what's the progress on this? You know, you've got to create status reports and you know, maybe this is, you need to report how many tickets have been processed every single week. Maybe you need to show the, the time to resolution, uh, which is a terrible metric, but people still track time to resolution. Um, you could generate this run book and then schedule it to run once a week or once a month or however long you need it to run. And now you don't have to 
deal with that. It's just generated. You could send it off to, you know, uh, just have this published on a on a on a wiki or something for the team, and now everyone just knows to go look for it, and they're not going to bother you for the data because you've created this thing, and now you've automated away that sort of step in your process. Um, so the last step that I asked um, ChatGPT to create in this um, in this runbook was let's post it to Slack, and we can actually post this image to Slack. So I'm going to just search for image Slack. I've got an action that'll do that for me. I drag it in, and I set up my configurations. Slack. The channel is DevOps Day Chicago. The message is hello world, and then the image is chart chart dot JPEG. We apply that, we run it, and it says it failed because I spelled it wrong. That looks good to me. All right, we'll give it another run. There, it's sent. And so if I come over here to Slack, like it got sent. So like super cool. Um, so this is actually just walking through that. So we did it. We had a couple minutes left to spare. We built two runbooks in, you know, under 45 minutes. Um, you know, clearly a little bit of it was canned, but what you can see here is. Uh, we all have lots of tasks that are, need to be run every single day and automating away a lot of that work um, and building automations to make it run easier is a great way to go for that. Um, you know, with this runbook that we just created, your next steps, you could save that runbook, set it up to run every single week, and now we can go do other things. Like, we don't have to worry about those status reports anymore. It's done. It's automated. Um, I've automated away a lot of my process reports this way just because let's just run some scripts. Let's run these run books, automate all that away, and now I can focus on the work that I need to do to, to push, uh, push the team ahead even further. Um, so going back to that original blog post that the guy wrote, right, he created 1,700 run books, and he did it because he didn't have to do anything else. His job was just create run books for seven months, None of us have time to do that. We all need to keep doing our regular job and then like maybe we've got 20 minutes or 30 minutes every now and then where we can create a run book. And the, the outcomes of creating these run books and these automations is that your outcomes are improved, your time to resolution is decreased, um, the team can collaborate on all these things and it's all automated. Reducing your toil, um, increasing the observability, all of these things help make ours job as DevOps and SRE professionals easier. And um, with this open source tooling, with Jupyter Notebooks, it's all online, it's easy to use, um, and there's hundreds of automations built in. Um, so with that, I really do thank you all for coming here and, and listening to, to the workshop. Um, if you want to check out the GitHub repo, it is at runbooks.sh. You can download it. Uh, it is a Docker image, so you can run it locally on your machine. You can try out the free trial that I was using here um, as part of my demo. Uh, the blog post, that's the link to the blog post, uh, things I learned uh, managing SRE at some of the world's big busiest ga gambling sites. And I'm Doug Sillers. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out. You can find me on all the social medias um, if you want to talk more about um, runbook automation or anything else. Um, and with that, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys hanging out. Thank you, Doug. Uh, let's hear it one more time for Doug, everybody. Thank you. All right, we're going to be quiet in here until 3.15, where we're going to have our next workshop. We're going to have Duan Ahmed and Peter O'Neill talking about enforcing 
fine-grained policy control across development and production environments. So we'll see you back here at 315, anybody who wants to take part in our second workshop. Thank you.
All right. We're going to get started with our second workshop here. Let's everybody welcome Dylan Ahmed and Peter O'Neill to the stage. Let's hear it for them. All right. You guys want to take us away? Thank yep. you. Hello, Chicago. So typically, this is a workshop. That means it's a smaller size room. We have people with their laptops out. But obviously, this is not the case. <laughs> We got, we got a pretty big room here, uh, lots of space. Uh, so yeah, so if you guys have your laptops with you, anyone planning to actually follow along on this work workshop or people just watching? I see one. All right, all right, OK. Cool, not a problem. We're definitely going to be doing uh, some of the demoing up here. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm the one. I work at a company called Ivan, so more on that later. I live in the beautiful east coast of Canada. So I work as a senior developer advocate. And Peter. Yeah, so I'm Peter. I work at a company called WebRiot. We specialize in digital transformations, uh, helping companies move to or from the cloud or doing technology audits to understand where they can do better. Cool. So I was told this is the big green button. I've heard that at least six times today. OK, so I'm <laughs> pressing the big green button. Do I need to point? Ah, OK, yeah. OK. So I don't need the big green button. It's not a magic big green button. It's not <laughs> a magic green button. OK, 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 cool. So we have our beautiful photos there as well. Yeah. Um, so OK, so what are we going to talk about? So obviously, it's Terraform, it's Open Policy Agent, and also a data platform. So let's, let's get started with Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent, this is a tool that's been around for a good amount of time uh, in the CNCF. It is a graduated CNCF project uh, built to help unify your policy across the stack, right? And so essentially what this means is you're able to define uh, what you want to happen throughout your systems in one common language and distribute that amongst uh, throughout your system so that you can say uh, maybe you want to define what RBAC is or ABAC and have that centralized policy that you can understand and trust is being implemented across those services, right? And so this is, this is like I said, been around since 2016. There's been a large amount of adoption from the community. It has a very vibrant and large community. We have about, I think, seven or 8,000 members in the Slack channel right now. So if you want to uh, get involved and contribute and talk to people who are currently using it, uh, that is a great place to go to start communicating and understand uh, how you might get started in the project or use it for your own systems. Absolutely. It's a very welcoming project as well. So of course, when we're talking about Terraform and we're talking about policy, we need something to deploy, right? Something as a demo. Mm -hmm. So today, we're talking about a data infrastructure. So what is data infrastructure? In plain words, everyone needs a database, right? So whether it's your relational DB, maybe your NoSQL, Kafka. So Ivan, the company I work at, so we are the trusted open source data platform for everyone. So lots of buzzwords. So let me break it down for you. So at the corner of the screen, you see that uh, we provide security, uh, SLA. Uh, the, the top part is the, the projects we provide as a service. So all the popular open source projects from Apache Kafka to PostgreSQL to Redis, and those could be deployed to cloud of your choice across 150 different regions. So in today's workshop, we'll actually try to build some resources on any of these clouds, but then use Open Policy Agent to control those those deployments. Cool. And then uh, I, let's take a quick polling here. Who uh, uh, for like these toolings? Like first off, is anyone here currently using uh, databases on Ivan? All right. Cool. This anyone heard the name Ivan before? Okay. Uh, all right. Second tool. Anyone here deploying stuff with Terraform? Oh, there we go. All right. A little bit cool. better. And how about uh, open policy agents? Anyone written policies that they're using in their systems currently? OK, we have one. Cluster level. OK, so inside Kubernetes. Inside Kubernetes. All right, OK. Outside of that, not really. All right, so what we're going to look at, look at how, if you're not running policies inside like a CRD, how to, how to, how to get those and, and run those. Uh, anyone using any other sort of policy management tools besides OPA? Azure policies. Azure policies? Nice, nice. OK, cool. Uh, all right, cool. That, that gives us a nice understanding of where people are and kind of where we need to kind of focus on. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. OK. So everything starts with a story. And obviously, we have a story today as well. The story is about a junior DevOps engineer. This is Rapu. Uh, so Peter, 
I think we both know Rapu, right? Both know Rapu. He has quite the reputation. Yes. <laughs> so, so what's the challenge? What's the challenge Rapu is facing? Well, Rapu here, he is a new engineer, and he's been given a lot of power being able to deploy things. And so as you can see, Rapu seems a little confused because Rapu has these capabilities to deploy these resources and create all these things because right, we trust our engineers to do the right things. But sometimes, you know, just because you're trusted doesn't mean that things go the way you expect them to, right? So now we want to help Rapu. We want to make sure that these systems are going to be safe and easy for Rapu to use by building policies around what he's doing so that he can trust his own deployments. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Rapu is a junior DevOps engineer, and the engineering team is based in Montreal, Canada. So obviously, the development environment, they want to deploy to Google, North America, Northeast one, which is the Montreal region. They have prod deployments as well in US East. So Rapu, in his first week, he has been deploying all over, to e even like Europe cloud zones. So in today's workshop, our goal would be to provide some guardrails using open policy agents so that when Rapu tries to deploy using Terraform, he either gets a yes or no. Um, so, so just to remember for, for the workshop, the dev environment is on AWS US East. Uh, uh, the dev environment is Google Cloud North America, which is the Montreal region. Prod is AWS US East. But we'll, we'll show that uh, during the demo as well. Mm -hmm. So the architecture slide, um, the way it works is, let's say it, if it's your, in your local machine, you have some Terraform files, and you're doing a Terraform plan. Open policy agent has some policies. So it matches the Terraform plan with some policies that you write as system admin. And based on that, it's a simple yes or no, whether it's going to allow or you don't allow. And then with an allow decision, you can deploy to cloud of your choice, whether it's a data infrastructure, whether, let's say, an uh, EC2 instance. That really doesn't matter because as it's an API call later. If you don't allow, obviously, then you can do certain stuff. You can do a notification. But you might ask that, OK, so this is from your local machine to deployment. What happens in CI? Mm -hmm. Right, so this is just that same, that same picture, but a little more detailed, right? So us understanding what the different components are. On the left-hand side here, we have the local dev machine. And this is going to be where you're going to be writing your Terraform files, what you want to create, how you actually want uh, your resources to come out in the end, right? This is going to be paired with a Rego file. The Rego file is going to be how we define our policy. And the policy is going to state exactly how those resources sh should look and if there's any sort of uh, stipulations, right? Do you want tags? Do you want specific sizes? Or are you going to limit who can create them, right? These are all part of the policy uh, that's going to be enforced when that Terraform file is run, right? And so we take, those, uh, we take those files that you're writing on your local machine, we drop them into our CI-CD pipeline, and then we have all the magic in the middle where that Terraform plan gets converted into a binary file, and that binary file gets turned into JSON. This is important because Open Policy Agent likes things written in JSON. Right? If you're running Kubernetes, you convert it to CRD, but typically we're going to be using JSON because it is a structured language that's very easy for uh, open policy agent to walk through that structure and understand what the data is that it, that it is working with very quickly and very efficiently, right? And so here we see on the right-hand side of the middle, right, Opus taking in that policy and any sort of external data, right? You may connect that to a user database. You may connect that to uh, some sort of state management system where you're pulling in uh, what exactly exists out there. So you can just you can augment your policies with any type of external data that you want to connect into it. And then OPA will make that decision. And then you can allow or deny API calls or service to service connections or anything you want to connect that OPA agent to. Great explanation. So why would someone use, let's say, a general purpose policy engine like OPA uh, and they could have, let's say, a different policy engine they're already using? Mm -hmm. Well, the nice thing about it is you get a lot of the uh, what, what we like to call policy development lifecycle, right? So it's very similar to uh, your regular software development lifecycle, but you get to do those same practices with your policies, right? You get to uh, define things up front, check them into Git, run them through a CI, and understand exactly what the impact of those policies are going to be before you implement them, right? Like understanding if you are going to restrict access to Kubernetes clusters, you want to know that those clusters aren't going to be disconnected before you actually, when you apply those policies, right? And so 
by using something like OPA that has this kind of GitOps mindset baked in from the beginning, you get a lot of those practices that we are used to using uh, kind of baked into the process up front for you. Great to know. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so this is the part of the workshop where we actually do stuff, right? So it's supposed to be a very hands-on workshop, mm -hmm. but fear not. Even if you'd like to follow along and make us do the workshop, yeah. that is OK. We're going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. But if any of you are following along, that's perfectly OK. So to get started, so this is the slide that you take a photo. So that QR code would take you to a GitHub repository. That GitHub repository would have all the instructions. So actually, let's show that repository real quick. And so yeah, even, even though we're going to be running through all this stuff up here, anytime you want to go back and access that repository, it will still be up there for you to run through these same steps if you want to uh, practice these deployments on your own. So we have mentioned the challenge, was the challenge you're going to solve, and some prerequisites. So of course, I have the tools installed on my machine, but let's say you go home tonight and you're trying to do this workshop, you need to uh, follow these prerequisites. So one of those are you need to have Terraform installed on your local machine, and you need to sign up for an Ivan account, which is completely free to do. You don't need to uh, provide your credit card. And we have a free plan as well. So I'm already signed in, so it will see show something like this. Um, and then if you go here, it has the architectural diagram as well. So you don't need to take a photo of the slides we have. All of the things we mentioned are in the, uh, this repository. Yeah, and here we are using Ivan as the service that Terraform is connecting to. But right, you can you can replace Ivan and do any sort of other Terraform modules that create resources, and they're going to be very similar. Right, we just needed something on the end to create resources for. Absolutely. So here I'm using Ivan Terraform provider. Just an example. It could be your AWS provider. It could be something else. This is just an example. All right. So. Let's say if any of you are actually doing it with us, uh, if you could install the prerequisites, that would be great. But at any time, maybe after the workshop, if you have questions, we can. We can, um, we can you could also stop us during, you just raise your hand, and we'll repeat the questions back if you guys have questions about anything. We, we, we are used to running this as a workshop, so feel free to interrupt us. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to do the workshop. Mm. Follow along, and then if you have questions, then uh, let us know. All right. So assuming that I already have an Ivan account, so what I'll go, I I'll do is, uh, so this is how the console looks like. And let's say I want to create a service. So if I want to create a service on Ivan, so let's say I want to create a, a Redis service. Not sure if it's large enough. Uh, all right. So the resource to create a Redis service looks something like this. So you define a project, which is your namespace. You define a plan. So plan is basically your compute, your memory, like how beefy the machine is. So for the demo, hobbyist is fine. Uh, service, you give it a name, doesn't matter. Cloud name is where you pick those regions. So those 150 regions across five different cloud providers. So let's say you do AWS US East One, Google North America, up cloud, doesn't matter, you choose. So with those four lines, if you do a Terraform apply, auto-approve if you're adventurous, mm -hmm. then uh, you'll have something like this running. So, so this gives you a service URI. You have the host, port, username, uh, a fully functional running Redis instance on the cloud. But Peter. Rapu has been doing that, right? So now we want to talk about open policy agent and how that comes into play. Yes. And so this is, th this is where Rapu has been getting into trouble because Rapu always forgets which region he's supposed to be using, right? Like Rapu is a remote worker, and so he thinks, oh, maybe I'm deploying to, 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 to the East Coast region, or maybe I'm deploying to the Ca Canada region. And so now let's, let's take things through. Uh, oh, yeah. And so yeah. So let's uh, see the Terraform files we have, right? So we saw the service running, but how we even get there? For those of us who are not absolute Terraform experts, so let's break down all these different pieces of Terraform files. So the first one you see on the screen is provider.tf. So provider.tf tells Terraform, because there are different Terraform providers, and what Terraform provider does is it's a link from your Terraform command line 
to the API. It doesn't matter which API, whether it's on-prem or cloud resources, to create and manage your cloud resources. So here I'm using iEvent here from provider. I'm specifying a version number uh, and then which, which variable I need. So iEvent API token is a variable that's needed for um, the provider to work. Next is the variable section. So of course you can hard code everything, but just like following good programming practices, we have these two variables, uh, the API token and the project name. Ivan project is a namespace where you group different resources. And then we have the sort of the meat and potato of the project, so the, the service file. So service file has those, those four lines. Uh, you have the project name, the plan name, service name, and the cloud name. So once you put those three files, on an empty directory, you put your API token, whether you could pass it as a TF VARS file. So I saw a lot of hands saying that you know Terraform, so I'm not going to the absolute basics, assuming that you know how to pass in a variable, um, then you can... Um, Good? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so that's how you create a resource. All right, so let's, so we actually divided up this repository in different modules. So we have five modules. The first module is where you just create a resource, right? There's no open policy agent, you just create a resource. The second module is where we bring in open policy agent. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the second module. So Peter, do you wanna walk through like why we need a TF plan.json, what does it do? Yep, yep. And so uh, with that first module, right, we showed that we created the resources beforehand so you could see that the Redis instance is already up and running. Uh, so now we're doing that same thing, uh, but instead we are adding some steps here and we're gonna show how this works manually, but typically you're gonna run this in a CI CD pipeline and this would be an automated process, right? So here we have, uh, the Terraform init, Terraform plan, and then so here's the actual interesting bit where we're gonna output this as a binary file. Outputting as a binary file allows us to easily uh, convert that into a JSON file. Um, at least as far as I know right now, there's not an easier way to do this. But, so this is, this is the simple way to do it, is uh, convert to binary, convert to JSON. And so we, here we see that second command here is Terraform show, uh, and then outputting uh, that as a JSON plan. Right, so this gives us the format that OPA likes, and once we have that, right, here's an example of what this could look like. Um, this is going to show the plan in JSON format that is, it's creating this, this Redis instance here in this Google North uh, region, uh, and a bunch of other change factors on what it is creating, right? And so and there, there might be an API token in the repos the repository. It's an expired token, so no need to panic. <laughs> yeah. No security leaks here. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so now that we have that, right? So now we've prepped this so that we can now uh, see what the first uh, piece is for that. Uh, Opa. Let me go back to the. I want to show this. Right, and so that's that first part, that's that input JSON that we need. And so the second part here is us writing this regal policy. So we'll go back to, to the repository, and so we're gonna look at the policy that we're going to be creating here, right? So now this is going to be uh, your first view into what the Rego language looks like. Rego is a purpose-built policy language, right? Purpose-built, meaning that it was designed to work hand-in-hand -hand with Open Policy Agent, right? Um, and so it is, it's, oh, it's a standalone language. Uh, we, for the project, it was decided that it was best to create a new language because piggybacking off of another language brings with it a lot of baggage that didn't exactly help with uh, defining policies and how they should work. But by creating a new language from the ground up, we were able to uh, develop built-in functions for all the types of policies you might need, right? If you want to work with, uh, any sort of JWT tokens, cryptography, uh, bring in date time stuff, like very simple things that you may not think about, right? We were able to design and build a lot of those built-ins with the help of the community. Most of these uh, built-ins were contributed by the community as they needed them, as they were working with different data types. We were able to add them uh, piece by piece to have the robust library that we have today, right? And so here we have a Rego file uh, and so this is a standard standard structure. We have the package at the top. This is just a naming 
uh, naming convention separation so that you can divide your policies uh, based on use case or maybe based on like teams or however you want your naming convention to separate your policies. Uh, we're doing a couple imports here. This first one is just a name change, right? So typically the input file, that JSON that we're creating, it just comes in as the name input, but to make our policy a little more readable, we're renaming, renaming it to TF plan so that we know we're cycling through that Terraform plan data. Uh, here we're importing future keywords. This is something that as we move closer and closer to version uh, 1.0, we are updating the regular language to add in new keywords like if, uh, else contains right things that sound very natural to the English language so that your policies are more understandable to people who may not have written the policies themselves right we're getting that that policy closer and closer to the English language to make it uh, more readable by anyone who needs to be involved with them and so next up here we are hard coding a couple of variables just to kind of keep this simple at first we'll move them out of the way later uh, but we're seeing exactly what this policy is going to be looking for, right? We have defined our development environment, we have, we have defined our prod environment, and we have defined which resources we're actually looking for. So as we're cycling through, th these are the ones that we're gonna say like, oh, I see that you're creating a Redis instance, I see that you're creating uh, a Kafka instance, right? This is going to help us to isolate the resources as they're created, so we know that we want to analyze them and do something about it. Right, and then, so here we have defined some defaults. And so why are we defining defaults? It's because, uh, because if we don't define defaults, right, we end up with these undefined statements at the end. And right, this typically causes problems when you're in your, the CICD pipeline doesn't actually know what to, do, uh, what to do with this information at the end. So we're saying, by default, just don't allow this stuff to happen. And then we have what's actually uh, going to allow, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna flip those false bits to true when these things happen, right? And so we have our rules defined here. And so all of these lines need to be true for the entire rule block to be true. So in this first one, uh, right, so we have some, this is one of those keywords I was talking about, some resource in that TF plan document, plan values, root, module, resources, right? So we're saying we're looking for one, one of these resources, uh, we're saving it as a variable called resource, and then we're checking the, type of that that checking the type of that resource. And if that type is one of the types we have defined, we're going to check where it is being deployed, right? So we're looking at the cloud name for that resource, and does that match the dev environment that we define, right? So this is a very simple rule to say, allow dev deployment when it is in the right resource zone. And then we have the same thing uh, for the prod environment as well. So the question was, essentially it's doing a loop through all resources. Correct, so we are going to be walking through, uh, right, that's that sum resource here, right? We're walking through every resource that's being created by this TF plan. Obviously we're just creating one resource, but you could have hundreds or thousands uh, in, the, in, that, in, that, uh, in that loop. And so we are gonna check each one of them, but we're only gonna be looking for certain ones. Uh, in this case, this Ivan Redis is the one that matters here. And so now that we have this, now that we understand what the policy is that we have written, right now how does this actually get implemented and checked? So uh, we are going to be running OPA locally, right? Typically this is gonna be installed and run by GitHub Actions or Circle CI or Travis CI or whatever, wh wh whatever your process is. And so we have this here. I can show the, the you run it? Yes code, yeah, sure. All right, so assuming that you have your Terraform files and now you wanna just test out Open Policy Agent, you wanna convince your engineering team that it's a good tool to use. So what you'll do is you create, a, let's say within the same folder where you have your Terraform files, you have a policy folder. Again, this is just a good practice. You don't have to exactly follow this way. Here I have the Terraform.rego. So in Terraform.rego, I have the exact same thing, what we have in the GitHub repository, right? Uh, the resource types, and again, this is deny by default, that means if your resource is not part of these four resources, let's say someone's trying to deploy a click house instance, they can't because it's just not in the list, right? Mm -hmm. So once you have that, then uh, what we do is we have the OPA exec command.
This is much more fun when we have you guys running the commands, but absolutely. But we'll do it for <laughs> you. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So let's see if I have OPA. So OPA, if it's installed, is going to show you some uh, outputs for the help command. All right, and then OPA exec. Let me run the command, then we'll break it down all the different pieces of this command. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we see uh, a JSON response with a false result. So what did we run? I think it's easier to, to show in here. So we ran the OPA exec command, and the the decision flag we're passing is give me a decision on the allow prod deployment policy. And we're sending in tfplan.json as our input. So right. let's, let's see our tfplan.json. So based on our Terraform files, we have a tfplan.json. So here, if we look for the cloud name, so let's do a search on cloud underscore name. So we see that the cloud name is Google North America Northeast One Region. And now if I go back to my Terraform Rego, here we're seeing that dev deployment would be uh, if the cloud name starts with uh, dev.cloud, which is, uh, it's in data, but the cloud name you can see from here, the Google Cloud North America Region, and the prod has to be AWS US East Region. So since Rapu is trying to deploy to uh, the prod instance using the Google North America Northeast One region. We're seeing it false. If you have JQ installed, you can get just the true or false Boolean. Right, and so this TF plan that we're looking at here is the one uh, from earlier when we created that Redis instance. So this is the one. This is the fresh TF plan that was just created. So the exit code is going to be non default, right? Yeah. Uh, so with that, right, we're asking for a decision. So whether a decision is true or false, we're just returning uh, a JSON object. Uh, but those are just words, right? So it's not. So so the actual uh, return isn't going to be a failure state if it says false. It's just returning the word false, right? Because that is the value that we set. And so what you want to do with that return value uh, is kind of up to you in that CI/CD pipeline. So you could say matches word false, matches word true, and then, you, and then you know what to do with it, right? As opposed to relying on the exit code of the command. Mm -hmm. So that's important because your CI wouldn't, well, you can parse in the, in the CI, but in CI, it's must e much easier if you just have a Boolean true or false. Mm -hmm. So if it's false, then it's not going to be deployed. Let's say if it gives up actions, a separate step for a Slack notification. Uh, and so that was module two. So let's go back to our um, tutorial. So here we have module two and three where we wrote our rego. And using rego, we tried to see if certain uh, Terraform plan would be successful or not. So in section three, the rego has a lot of hard-coded values. So let's say like the dev environment cloud prefix is hard-coded, right? All of these are hard-coded, whoops. Uh, so you don't want those hard-coded stuff uh, when you're creating resources. So in module number four, let's see how we can get rid of some of these hard-coded stuff with data block. Peter? Yeah, and so this is, obviously we hard-coded the, the variables just to make that easy to read, but typically you're going to be uh, pulling in some sort of external data, right? Like this is that third block here. You have the policy and the data that you want to provide to it. And so in this particular case, uh, we're just providing a JSON block, but you might be you might be pulling from some sort of Teams directory or something that says, oh, okay, this team can deploy specifically to this region, right? You can get as nuanced as you want there, and so this data block could be uh, yeah, team data or region data or some other sort of data block, right? And so now, uh, just like we're able to cycle through that Terraform plan JSON, we're also going to cycle through uh, this data dot JSON and. OPA is going to be the central point that compares those two to understand uh, what's going to happen, right? So we remove the hard-coded uh, variables, and here we see that we are referencing that data block. And so uh, in this particular case, when you are running things, uh, it's going to come in under data. 
Uh, that's just like the keyword that says, this is where this information is nested. So in that data block, uh, we are looking for uh, dot, sorry, dot dev dot cloud. And then here we see like dot dev dot cloud and dot prod dot cloud. So that's basically just moving that out. But that is essentially the same, um, the, the, the same process. So it's not actually changing how this policy is functioning. And then we can see uh, run the same Terraform out, binary, JSON, and execute that same decision, right? And so this decision flag is looking specifically at allow.prod, but you can point that at allow.dev as well. If you name it data.json, it will automatically pick it up. But if you have other data sources or integrations that you want to use, basically you just have to tell OPA that that exists in some sort of configuration file to say, this is where my data lives and this is what my data is called. But data.json is just a keyword that it looks for and says, if I see a data file, I will, I will insert it automatically. Great question. Um, so this was one of the fun time when we actually do like a hands-on workshop in a small size room where we say, okay, so we created two policies on our own and now it's time for you to do some homework. Mm -hmm. So we have some additional challenges where you create these additional policies. So let's say the first one is project must start with team names and service name must include app name. So in the data.json, we have both of these values, right? We have the team name, and we have the app name as well. So it's okay that we're not doing the hands-on workshop, but let's say if you try this uh, at your home, uh, you can create those, those additional policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can go through uh, and, right, we're, we're doing syntax like string matching, uh, very, to keep it very simple, but there are various other built-in functions that you can use to right, do some sort of data matching. Uh, so you can see those in the open docs. We have that in the slides that I think will be distributed after this. I yeah. think so, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you can, you can check that out and see uh, what other built-in functions there are to do those kinds of matching. Just looking at the time, I think we should move to module five. Let's do it, yeah. All right, and so. Who doesn't love testing, right? Right, like no, it's, it's not a real language if you can't do unit tests with it. So. Here we see, um, we see another Rego file, and, but this time the Rego file is prefaced with this test underscore. And once again, this is a default value that uh, OPA is going to look for. And so when it sees this test file, it's gonna allow you, like, or it, it sees a Rego uh, file prefaced with test, it's gonna know uh, what to do with it. It's, it's gonna know that this is part of the unit testing feature. And so similar to the rules that we were looking at before, we have a rule block here. Uh, this rule block actually only has one statement, but we're passing in a bunch of mock data, right? This is going to look very similar to that TF plan uh, uh, section that we looked at earlier, but we're only, we're, we're taking a, a subset of that and shoving that in here as a mock data, as a fake resource, and we, wanted, we want to make sure that uh, the data, given a specific data set, it's going to return something that we expect, right? So here we're seeing test allow uh, dev deployment, and the second one here is test not allow uh, prod deployment, right? So we're expecting a true response at the top, and we're expecting a false response at the bottom, right? And so with these, well, let's actually run these. I'll oh, just copy this over here, uh, go back to VS yes. Code, yep. and then I think we're in the right directory, right? And so we, we can see that it's automatically picking those up. We have those. Uh, right, defined right here in this test format. And so we can see that, uh, I think that we can pass in a flag to, right, uh, no, wait, there was a, mm, let me do this. Always, always look at the documentation. Let's see here. So there should be a, uh, a verbose mode that we can check out. Mm, yeah, I just put it in the wrong spot. That's what it was. Okay. There we go. And so we can see those same, those same tests here, but we can, right, if one is failing, it's much easier to see it this way and to actually understand uh, which one that you want to check out. And so going back over here, um, this is, once again, the part of the workshop where we have you guys do things and we walk around and check your code, right? And so uh, with those same uh, policies that we would have had you wrote, 
written earlier, we would have you write unit tests, and we'd also have you uh, kind of convert the policies to be dry or do not repeat yourself to remove the mock data uh, from the testing so that you can build up a section of mock data that you can reference and manipulate. Uh, but all of this is within the uh, Git repository here, so you can test it on your own and you can reach out to me or Dewan yeah. uh, with any questions. We also, yeah, we also give out swag for people who are <laughs> this, uh, doing these exercises. So since folks are not doing exercises here, mm. maybe in exchange of questions, we can give out some swag, right? Yeah, but I think we did have one question. Yes. Two, two, two questions. Perfect. Okay. Hello? Okay. So the question I have is, so to me it seems like you're writing tests for a test because to me the rego file is a test for the Terraform validation and now you're saying you need to write unit tests for the rego. So you have three things to propagate changes across. How do you scale that or how do you deal with? And, and so th th that, that is an interesting question and because it is, it is a policy, right? And so what we're looking at here is very simple where we are testing like that resource that looks like something, right? Where these unit tests come in is typically when it's much more convoluted, right? Like typically when your policies are looking at either larger data sets or they're pulling in, uh, you know, thousands of resources or they're combining things in a way that is non-trivial. And so that's typically when those unit tests, especially when you are talking about access to resources as opposed to the creation of resources, you want to make sure that uh, your policies don't break things before you deploy them. And so in this particular case, I, yeah, I probably wouldn't write a unit test on my, like, let me create a Terraform resource. But right, if I was doing something like, oh, let me, let me make sure that my team has access to my Kubernetes cluster, right, I would probably have some sort of unit test that says, make sure these accounts still have access to the cluster before these policies are applied. Right? And so that kind of just gives you a layer of protection, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that your policy isn't going to change current functionality. One other thing about scaling is the test will actually help your scaling, because ob obviously you're not going to have one resource. Let's say you have dozens or hundreds of dozens of resources. So let's say one of your engineers is trying to deploy and they can't. They're blaming the SRE team or DevOps team that, hey, like, why I can't deploy? So if you have a habit of creating tests every time you're creating these policies, then that could be easily seen, okay, because of this specific policy, then you could do even the verbose. This is why you can't deploy rather than you having one more ticket to resolve. Mm -hmm. Understood. I'm still not sold if I want to write more tests because I'm already writing. To me, Rego is a policy, but it's also a test. It's like an integration or validation test for my IAC. Mm -hmm. So writing tests for that, yeah, I got to think about that. So the other question I have is, so this works beautifully for a GitOps model, right? And when you have CI CD pipeline. So um, I use Azure policy, and as I mentioned, open policy agent on the Kubernetes cluster. So what that does is there's 10,000 ways to skin a cat to deploy a cloud resource or create a cluster resource in K8, right? So um, those policy agent installed there, or Azure policy, for example, or AWS organizational policies, prevents um, people from doing things uh, that don't depend on this GitOps model or this execution. So how do you see open policy agent being applied? Let's say somebody wants to use your SDK to create something or somebody wants to use uh, your command line to create something. How does that apply there, the open policy agent? Thing? So open policy agent has, uh, has a few different deployment models. And so CICD is just one of those, right? And so uh, you can run OPA as a as its own like container, you can run it as a standalone server. You can run it uh, like directly on the host as like a service or something, right? Like so, depending on uh, what's going to work. And so, like for really extreme workloads, you can run it as we have like a um, uh, a, a Go package that you can run it directly next to your code if you're doing like really um, data intensive stuff, uh, right? So we have these different deployment models so that OPA can slot in with what you're already doing. Right, and so there's very interesting uh, kind of talks out there where people have shown these different deployment models. One of my favorite was uh, Miro did this, where they have like the Miro board, and they're basically showing all of the decisions that are happening on the board, basically go through like a Kafka pipeline and get processed through OPA so that you can understand exactly which users have access to which resources at any given time. And when you have 30 users looking at a page with a thousand resources, right, you can see that those decisions are very, very coming through very, very fast. Right, and so 
that's something that's not a CI/CD pipeline, but those are actual access decisions that OPA is processing in real time. So depending on what you're doing will depend on how you deploy OPA. Yeah, and uh, on the data infrastructure side, on the same, same Kafka way, so there are two ways with Terraform and Kafka. Let's say you can have uh, Open Policy Agent running on the same VM so that you can control the topic level, during the runtime, like which topics get access or not. But obviously for managed services, due to security limitations, like not every company will let you run that additional script or service on that VM because they control the VM. So then all you're limited to is like the deployment stuff before the actual runtimes, okay? What you can or cannot deploy. But again, like depending on if you have your own services, you can, I think, do a, a whole lot more. Does it have a proxy mode? Does it have a proxy mode? So I'm thinking, like, if there was a proxy mode that OPA had, and now, let's say Terraform is calling AWS APIs, it intercepts those, runs those uh, things through the policy, and then rejects or denies it before it even gets to AWS. You understand my point, right? That's the layer that's missing. That's why I went to Azure policies, because regardless of however you make that API call, Azure's hosting the policies for me and running against them before they allow the deployment of that resource or reconfiguration of that resource. Yeah, and so unfortunately there's not an easy proxy with like the AWS CLI. There is a native integration with um, CloudFormation, okay. right? And so you can, uh, instead of having, I don't know what they're called, cloud policies or something, yeah. okay. but you, you can insert regal policies instead in their place. And so CloudFormation, as it's creating things, will process that regal policy uh, and against your own OPA server instead of running like the cloud policies, right? And so th th those integrations are kind of popping up more and more as uh, use cases emerge for it. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question about like, resources and links. So this slide has all the links. So you already probably have the QR code for the GitHub repository, but this has links to the Rego if you want to learn Rego, uh, if you want to learn about OPA docs, Terraform docs, or even Ivan docs if you want to spin up uh, some data resources. So just wanted to put it out there. Um, not waiting for the actual slides, but you can get started with all those. I'm gonna uh, show the, the QR code one more time as soon as you're done taking photos. So this, this QR code will take you to the GitHub repository. It has all the steps, but it gets even better. It also has, drum roll, uh, <laughs> solutions. So, if you feel lazy that I don't want to do those assignments, I have enough homeworks already. So we have the solutions for, but don't look at the solution first. Try, give it a go. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is, if you're free this evening, we have this awesome meetup, uh, open source data infrastructure meetup. Uh, we have these meetups all across the globe. I think the last one we uh, did in Toronto, right? Toronto. So we have this in Sydney, in Boston, um, Amsterdam, like different places of the world. So what's best uh, than doing one in Chicago? So six to eight, it's in Discover Financial. I was told that if you just mention Discover 606, people will know where that is. Six to eight, if you can register on meetup.com, that is fantastic. Even if you can't, I just show up. We have awesome food, networking. Cool. Uh, we have two minutes if there's any last questions. Otherwise, we will wrap things up. One more question? Yep. So with, so I can imagine once you start writing policies and you get good at it and it's really valuable, then you've got managing policy problems, um, especially across a distributed um, environment. So you may have said this before, but are there, uh, can policies be versioned? And is there a central registry where policies can be stored and then pulled from at um, deployment time? Because I would imagine in your example where it's living in the repo where the code is, you know. Yeah, that, that's probably not the right way to do it. You're absolutely correct. It typically, you want to separate your application code and your configuration code. So just as a, like your configuration, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, like you want to separate the policies as well. So that every time you're doing a CI, 
even for a policy change, it doesn't build your entire application code as well. Yeah, typically what you're going to have is you're going to have some sort of policy repository. So when you check those in, like it checks that those policies are valid. And then once they are checked in, right, those will then get pulled and uploaded into your policy server, right? And so that policy server is where OPA is going to go and pull down those, uh, those policies, right? So then you might set that up on like a polling or you might push, you might set it up so that it's pushing them into it, right? But that pull versus push model is up to like your design. Uh, so that's how OPA is actually going to get those policies in that distributed fashion wherever they're running. Uh, and then depending on how you do separate your services and stuff, right, you might have uh, segments of those policies that go to specific OPAs as they're running. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I just want to add, it also philosophically depends if you're in a mono repo or micro repo setup, right? And uh, I don't know if you can templatize these policies or not. That's the approach I'd prefer. So it's, to me, it's kind of like this policy is kind of like a unit test for the IAC. So I would keep it highly coupled with the IAC that it's actually validating. Yeah, if IAC is your use case, that yeah. uh, definitely, case, yeah. 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 Yeah, cool. So All right, folks who ask questions, if you want to have some swag, feel free to come up, mm -hmm. chat with us. We do have some swag for you. Cool, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dune and Peter. Let's hear one more time. And then uh, we'll be back here at 4.45 to close up for the day. And uh, we'll be talking to you then. Thank you.
it's dangerous. Liquids by electronics, what could go wrong? Totally could go wrong. Besides many things. Okay, we are at our closing ceremony, which sounds fancier than it is. Get out. No, 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 we've got a couple things to talk about. So uh, as people are, are trickling in, we've just got a few things. Uh, one of the things I love to do at, the, at this end, so we've had a day of learning. It's the first day. We've got a whole other day going. I am uh, telling you what we're going to do in a second so we have a, little, have a minute to think about it, but we love to kind of go around and just say, hey, what's one thing that you learned today? So again, we could call this the TIL, Today I Learned. What's the thing you learned today? So take a minute and think about that a little bit. Um, but I'll give a couple announcements while people are coming in, just uh, a few things. Uh, some are reminders. We will be sending out an email uh, later tonight, possibly much later tonight, depending on when I get uh, But there will just be a couple little updates. It will include a link to where um, the uh, feedback survey for day one. We'd love to, to, to hear what you think. We'll be continuing tomorrow. Um, a couple of reminders. And then... Uh, so one of those reminders, just we will be doing the uh, COVID protocol again tomorrow. So just be ready for that. It should be very quick. We also how that worked, so that's easy enough. Speaking of that as well, we have a lot of uh, leftover and extra COVID tests. So if anybody wants to stock up, please uh, come to the registration desk, help yourself. Um, as we know, they're not always the easiest thing to find and you know, it could be helpful and we never know. Um, one of the other things, we got some, some feedback. We're going to, in the spirit of continuous improvement, for our open spaces process tomorrow, in addition to, you know, our sort of way we've always done it, you know, come up here with your post. And I did say, I know I, we had said, hey, if you don't feel like doing that, you know, come bring it up to us and we'll read it. We'll take that one better. So we're going to have a form that you can elect to use during the process. We're not going to say, hey, think about our episode for the next thing, but you know, just put it in that way. Those that come in, we'll, we'll read and put on a post-it for you either way, um, just to make, to, you know, not everybody enjoys standing up here like you and I do. Uh, I'm assuming you enjoy this. I do. I do enjoy it. Okay. I do enjoy it. Um, so, and we also have, there are a couple um, sponsors are having some events tonight. Um, so Tailscale is having a happy hour somewhere. Is, is anyone from Tailscale in here now? Looking? Where's Tanner? Where's Penguin? Okay. Does anybody know where the <laughs> At Rivers. Oh, really? Okay. So not too far from down here. Is a, does anybody know when it is? What? What? Oh, five to seven. So great. So just boop, bop right over there. Go over to Rivers. Hang out with some traders. Uh, <laughs> if you know, you know. Traders. Not traitors, traders, like, mer okay. <laughs> Fed's like, this is not helping. I still don't understand. That's why I said, if you know, you know. Um, and uh, Flux is having a, um, Nick's OS, Flux folks. And that one we will, uh, in sometime in the next couple of minutes, figure out where that is going on. It was in the email, too. It was in the email. All those emails that you got from me that nobody reads. But that's cool. I don't mind. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> All documentation is right only. We know this. All right. So uh, we enough enough. The other thing is just we do ask um, after this. We love you. We're so glad you're here. We got to get out. So the venue is closing the doors behind us at 5:30. So continue your conversations. Head to the happy hours, things like that. But before we go into that. Um, Trevor, do you have my, okay, awesome. So I'd love to hear, again, we said, this is the part of closing ceremony we call TIL, Today I Learned. So what's one thing you learned today that you didn't know before today that you'd like to share with us? And just raise your hand and Trevor will bring you a mic. Uh, it came up during one of our open spaces that it can be useful to separate between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. All right, excellent. Someone else, something you learned today, or something interesting. I guess it's implied. It doesn't have to be interesting. That's a lot of pressure. I learned that people are running Kubernetes databases in production and uh, sleeping at night at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. Uh, so oh. Go ahead, Serena. Um, 
I learned how to talk to HR about disability accommodations because I heart stimulant shortages. Mm. Oh, I don't think you're... Nope, but there we go. I learned that Maddie's daughter is way funnier than he is. <laughs> you just you just learned that today? Some of us have known this for a while. Anyone else have something they'd like to share? Uh, making it psychologically safe for newcomers to uh, ask uh, questions and help them get up to speed. So um, that was one of my open spaces takeaways. Uh, do better and that. Excellent. Amazing. Anyone else have something they want to share from today? It's okay if you don't because not everybody feels like bringing it up. But just, yeah. Oh, So I'm going to steal from Maddie's daughter. I'm going to use an acrostic in my next lightning talk. I <laughs> thought that was a great idea. Yeah, just uh, one thing, a few things I learned was actually all our vendors actually stopped by and talked to them. I learned about some new vendors I didn't know about. I thought I knew them all, and then I found out I don't. <laughs> DA sponsors. Um, w one thing in terms of conference organizing that I really liked and I learned and I'm absolutely going to steal is the little stamp thing uh, and the prize for, for completing all the stamps. Sponsor Passport, shout out to Albert on our sponsor committee who puts that together and we will have some awesome prizes tomorrow. If you haven't filled out your Sponsor Passport, go ahead and do that. Another and thing that I learned that I wanted to share with everyone because I thought it was so insightful, um, someone said in our open space that uh, as juniors, they're not necessarily afraid of asking questions because they're afraid they're gonna look silly. Uh, they're afraid of taking up their mentor's valuable time. And I thought that was a, a mind-blowing sort of revelation, like, oh. That's a, that, that is really interesting, because we, we project a little bit onto why, you know, and we don't always ask the why. We just assume that that's what it is, maybe telling on ourselves a little bit sometimes. Any other thoughts, things that someone learned? Um, I learned that with things like um, remote working like it is now that Asking someone to just put the emoji for the day can open up some conversations um, to what's going on outside and help build community. Oh, I like that. Can you? I don't want to put you on this, but can you can you explain it just a little bit more? Because I'm real interested. So when you say put the emoji of the day, like where does that put happen? an emoji of the day while they're doing stand up? You know, oh, put your okay. emoji today, and you know, one of the things people said is like, put a sad face because my dishwasher broke today, or you know. I'm having this problem. It kind of opens the door to more than just I'm having these are my plans for work. Like, what's going on? You know? I like that. Are, are Floor or Dewan or Jen in the room right now? These are all my colleagues. <laughs> and I was like, maybe we're going to start doing this. I really like that. Oh, wait. Oh, Chris has. I didn't see you had the mic right. Yeah, uh, we did the platform value stream map deal and ended up splitting SRE and DevOps practices uh, across the value stream pretty cleanly, um, including one section that was overlap. And that was the thing I wasn't expecting. I did not have the overlap column before I showed up here today. Um, but like even more encouraging, it was pretty amicable and agreeable and everybody was like, yeah, that makes sense. Like we're good. So we got, we got it solved y'all, congratulations. <laughs> it's done. It only took us 10 years, but we got it. Uh, yeah, I, I building on what uh, that person said over there, I learned from that talk this morning how emotions actually are relevant to our technical jobs, and being aware of those emotions can help us do better. So. Fantastic. A uh, couple more. Okay. Uh, I know people have been filtering in, so if you were sitting here before and this is repetitive, that's cool. Repetition is how we learn. Um, so tomorrow we'll be back again. Reminder that we'll be doing the COVID protocol again. Also reminder that we have a lot of extra leftover COVID tests. So feel free to come by the registration desk and help yourself to stock up at home or to other things you might be doing. We will be sending out an email later tonight, perhaps much later, that will include the survey for your feedback from for this day. Um, 
And we, uh, uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. And then there's happy hours. Uh, did anybody figure out where the tail scale, the tail scale one was at Rivers, the flux one was the one we weren't sure about. Uh, flux is at flux. O'Neill's on Wells, 411 South Wells Street, um, starting at 5.30, going until 8 p.m. It is in your email, so if you forget that, you can just. That one was, the tail scale one email, was But the tail scale not. one is not. But that's at Rivers like now, so just like go over there. And, you know, theoretically, you're probably we're supposed to register and stuff, but, you know, it's fine. Tell, tell them I said it was fine. Maddie said it was fine. <laughs> That's going to go real good. Um, should be awesome. Awesome. Well, with that, it, amazing. Uh, what a wonderful return to DevOps days. What a wonderful return to this building where the very first DevOps Day Chicago took place. And it's uh, real excited to come back tomorrow. Maybe bright-eyed, maybe bushy-tailed, but definitely back. And we've got some, some great talks tomorrow. We're going to see if Maddie remembers the program off the top of his head. We have... Craig and Dean from Discover, who will be talking about their enterprise journey with that. We love a good experience report. Um, Fitz is going to be talking about application reliability and a whole bunch of other things that look super interesting. Um, we have uh, Joshua Zimmerman is going to be joining up with a talk that he was going to give last year about navigating organizational politics. I am real excited for that talk. And uh, Jessica Kerr is going to be talking about open telemetry and all sorts of stuff. And we've got uh, great Ignites on tons of topics. And um, Eddie Knight is giving a workshop on shifting left, if I remember if I've got that exactly right. Secret Mind of the Ignites. Um, Fatima Cigar Overflow is about an ode to technical debt. Uh, John Willis is going to be uh, talking about uh, Deming. Shocker. But fascinating. Love love a good Deming talk. Um, uh, Kadasha is going to be talking about writing a technical blog. Okay, and if, if, if you're one of the ones that I'm stumbling on, it's not, no offense, you're all very important to me. Who, who am I forgetting? Dex, um, who? Jason. Jason, oh, that, that one I don't mind. That's fine. Jason, Jason E is always here, and we always want him back. So, so Jason is going to talk about how to fail in the cloud native way, and how to write a tech blog. Yeah, Kadasha, I said that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, uh, Laura. Laura was the other one. Yeah. Again, again, at least the people I forgot are people who've already spoken. So Laura Santa Maria is going to talk about how DevOps is like paper airplanes. And if I remember correctly, this is connected to her graduate work. And I'm not kidding. So I'm excited about that. That said, let's uh, see everybody tomorrow. Thank you for being here today. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. And let's have a great night and a great day tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>